Yeah, we've had actually problems with it. Thank you. 
Sorry for the delay, Madam Chair, we are ready to go now. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Oh, that's not good. We'll try this again, I'll whisper this time. No. Further away? Yeah. Ooh. How about now? Can you, no. Can you hear an echo? Are we good? <laughs> We're not good. We're not good. I can hear you, so who cares? Thanks, you need to keep going. Okay, well, welcome. Welcome, 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 welcome uh, to day two uh, here in beautiful Placer County. Um, we will start today with roll call and some rules for us all to follow. Thank you, Madam Chair. Commissioner Bradshaw. Here. Mr. Davis. Here. Mr. Falcone. Here. Commissioner Grisby. Present. Vice Chair Gordino. Present. Commissioner Lugo. Commissioner Lou. Here. Commissioner Martinez. Present. Commissioner Norton. Present. Commissioner Tavoloni. Chair Eager. Here. Senator Newman. Assembly Member Friedman. Madam Chair, we have a quorum. Thank you, Douglas. And on to our rules. On to our rules. What did I do with the rules? Oh, that's not good. The commission's meeting. Welcome to day two of the January 2023 commission meeting. The commission's meeting agenda is located under the handouts tab and also on our website at www.catc.ca.gov. American Sign Language is also being provided on the webinar for this meeting. You should see the translators on your screen. Any document the CTC creates can be translated into any language you need. Simply email us at ctc at catc.ca.gov and we will have them return to you as quickly as possible. Next slide. For our presenters, if you're on the agenda to make a presentation, please do your best to be succinct. Please remember to speak at a steady pace and allow our translating service adequate time for accurate translations. If you are presenting remotely, we hope that you will turn on your camera during your presentation if you have one. Next slide. We welcome comments from the public as part of each item at this meeting. For those attending in person, please submit a speaker slip to the clerk at the front of the room. And that's me up here. to Let us all know you wanna make a comment on the item. For those attending via GoToWebinar, you should see the webinar control panel likely located on the right hand side of your screen. There you will find the raise hand feature as well as the questions tab. We encourage you to use the raise hand feature as early into the item as you can to give the system time to acknowledge you. Alternately, you may use the questions tab to submit your comment. Please be sure to include the agenda item number you are commenting on. Commission staff will read the comment on your behalf. Excuse me. As a reminder, each registered attendee is provided a unique link and phone number and should not be shared with other participants as they are registered to your name and may cause confusion for staff when making comments. Next slide. For all of our meeting attendees, please do your best to be concise. Please make sure that your comments add new information. If you agree with the comments of a previous speaker, simply make that statement. Please remember to speak at a steady pace to allow our translating service adequate time for accurate translation. We often have many speakers. We ask that you make your point in three minutes or less. If for some reason we have many speakers on a topic, we may we reserve the right to limit comments to one minute if needed. Thank you for joining us for day two. Thank you, Douglas. So before we move on to our agenda, I believe our newly reelected Vice Chair Gardino would like to make a statement. Chair Eager, thank you, and I'll I'll make this.
pay no attention to the man behind the curtain. <laughs> As uh, our commissioner colleagues and staff and many of our stakeholders know, I have the pleasure uh, of creating and running community charity runs and walks. And we were able to revive uh, post uh, part of the COVID pandemic, our Santa run in Silicon Valley this last December. Uh, so if you would like a shirt so that you can sweat in style, they are on the stage. And yes, they are gender specific for a better fit. So there's uh, men's, um, I think we have medium through double X and women's, uh, I think the last small was just taken by our chair, but medium through extra large for women's cut. And if you have little ones at home, our kids fun run reindeer run shirts are pretty adorable. I wear this one myself. It looks <laughs> so please feel free to take those. We were able to, uh, uh, we were able to raise money for kids to go to college as first time in their family in um, in our underserved communities in Silicon Valley with this run. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. And please don't feel obligated if you take a shirt that you have to run. <laughs> uh, Vice Chair Gardino promised me I could wear the shirt, but I didn't actually have to run around in it, right? That's true, but if you, like me, succumb to one of these earlier, this is about 500 calories, so put on that shirt, walk around till you burn off those 500 calories, right? Will do. Good. See you at the end of it. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Um, I believe we have a, a speaker that would like to comment on tab number 43 from yesterday. Do we have someone um, online that would like to speak on that issue? Yes, we do. We have Shelly Cobb. Shelly, you're now unmuted and free to comment. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, okay. we can. My name is Shelly Cobb. I'm a volunteer with the community organization called CAMP, Community Association for the Modoc Preserve. I'm here to comment on item number 43 regarding the approval of the Modoc Road multi-use path phase two. Um, specifically the PS and E and ROW milestone for the ATP grant that was applied for in 2018. Um, we were aware of this uh, project, which was aligned along Modoc Road back in 2018, and that's how it was described in the application. Speeding forward to June of 2022, only hours before the end of public comment period for the MND, we learned that the MND had been issued and most no no one in our neighborhood had been alerted. Um, we were able to quickly get up to speed and form this group to oppose some of the details that came to light, specifically cutting down 63 mature historic trees along Modoc Road. Um, the alternative alignment given was to go through the Modoc Preserve which is a privately owned, legally protected nature preserve. And the deed of conservation easement is held by the land trust of Santa Barbara, who were not contacted or consulted before the MND was created and drafted, let alone approved by the board. Even though additional time was given and a, an open, a public comment open was reopened, um, the the serious concerns that we had were not addressed and specifically um, we all we went all the way back to the grant application submitted in 2018 and found that the original application contained many false statements and representations such as safe routes to school and the number of disadvantaged that are living in the area. Um, we would love to sit down and um, go through this in more detail. However, in the interest of time, I'll just let you know that we have had to file a injunction and lawsuit against the county as well as the Board of Supervisors for approving an MND that contains demonstrably false and misleading biological aesthetic statements and is in direct opposition to a deed of conservation easement that's already been issued to the Land Trust of Santa Barbara for the preserve. Um, we've uh, now finished a mandatory settlement conference as of this week. 
with the county and unfortunately they did not come to the table in good faith to uh, explore alternatives or even talk more about the um, alignment A, which is preferred by CAMP. Um, we, the, the uh, preferred alignment by the county, alignment B, still requires an easement that is not yet approved by the Lacumbre Water District or the Land Trust uh, Conservation Manager. And approval is unfortunately unlikely given that the county's high level project description is in direct violation of the Land Trust Deed of Conservation easement. Um, the, the Land Trust has sent a list of non-starters to the county that they have not responded to along with other letters that were sent during the public comment period that the county did not respond to as well. Because of the county's un unwillingness to compromise and discuss this, we recommend um, not approving the PSE and RAL milestones for this project and uh, encourage you to look into it further. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Shelley. Now we will have a presentation from Amy Miller from Asphalt Pavement Alliance. Um, they'll present Caltrans with will present Caltrans with two perpetual pavement awards. These awards acknowledge the Caltrans use of long life asphalt pavements as well as excellent design, quality and construction and value for the traveling public. Awards. Yeah, we like that. Great. Thank you. Hello. Oh, there we go. <laughs> Thank you for that introduction. I'm Amy Miller. I'm the National Director with the Asphalt Pavement Alliance. And the Asphalt Pavement Alliance represents the National Asphalt Pavement Association located in Greenbelt, Maryland. It represents the Asphalt Institute located in Lexington, Kentucky, and the consortium of all the state asphalt pavement associations, including your very own CalAPA and CalSEMA that are here today. Um, so um, we're very honored to be able to be here today to present to you these awards. Um, as one person told me last night, this has been a long time coming, um, so it's great to be here today. We think that it's really important to honor the work on, and highlight the work that Caltrans is doing with the wise decisions you're making and the important work that you're doing for the state of California um, with you and your partners here in the state. So we have two awards we're gonna give today, and these are first time awards for Caltrans. One is a perpetual payment by design, and the other is a perpetual payment by conversion. And um, what's important about these, we call them perpetual payments, you all call them long life payments. And um, these payments are opportunities, one, to save your natural resources, to lower greenhouse gas, gas emissions. Um, they also come into cost savings long term, and um, they allow the traveling public um, to save money, taxpayers to save money through that long-term investment and to ride on the smooth roads that they so much desire to ride on. So we're gonna to start today with our Perpetual Payment by Design Award. And to qualify for the award, the payment must be a newly designed and constructed asphalt road built over new or reconditioned subgrade. Um, these awards um, are um, received at the National Center for Asphalt Technology, NCAT at Auburn University, and they're evaluated to ensure that they do meet um, those, the criteria for a perpetual payment award. This particular award, the By Design Award, is a section of Interstate 5 from post mile marker 9.7 9 to post mile marker 24.9 in Sacramento County. Granite Construction Company and Tigert Aggregates, each focusing on the southbound and northbound lanes, simultaneously completed the 67 lane mile long life payment in 2021. In addition to being designed as a perpetual payment, recycled crumb rubber, aggregate base, and reclaimed asphalt pavement were used during construction. All this added up to a very successful fiscally and environmentally responsible project. So I'd like to start off with awarding Emergy Pinnapal District 3 Director with our Crystal Obelisk for this road. In addition, I'd also like to recognize Granite Construction Brian Dowd and Carter Rohrbaugh for the Granite's work in this project. Oops. 
right. From Tiger Construction, we have Pete Conlon and Mike Cunningham for their contribution to this project as well. Okay, hang on one minute. Yes. All right. Um, working together with contractor Tolis Incorporated, Caltrans, and the University of California Pavement Research Center work together on the Red Bluff Long Life Pavement Rehabilitation Project on I-5 in Tehima County in District 2. The project consisted of three layers with the top two layers containing reclaimed asphalt pavement and open to traffic in 2012. This extraordinary project was only made possible through the teamwork between government vision, university innovation, and industry commitment, and the work the pro and the work project rehabilitated a critical link on Interstate 5. In fact, what some to believe to be the most important north-south route on the west coast of the United States, connecting the three Pacific Coast states, as well as Mexico and Canada for trade and commerce. And so it's my delight to award um, the perpetual, by perpetual payment by conversion crystal wild lease to Christine Kingsley, who is the deputy director and asset of asset and program management in District 2. Additionally, we have Dr. John Harvey, Jeff Buschek, and Erwin Guada from UC Davis on behalf of the work done by University of California Payment Research Center. And then we last, lastly, we have Chris Hanley from TOLUS, who was our contractor who made the Good job possible. Thanks, Chris. All right, that includes our awards. Thank you very much and congratulations. Thank you, and um, behalf of all of the transportation nerds in the room that get excited about asphalt, uh, thank you so much for coming and letting us be a part of these awards, and congratulations to District 2 and District 3. Um, keep up the good work and innovation. Um, I know, Amarjeet, you told me about this when we were there. You promised me that you were doing this, so this is proof. This is proof that you're doing it correctly, so congratulations. <laughs> Yeah, Mike, want to try this one? Yeah. All right. I, I just want to, uh, uh, Mike Kiever, uh, Deputy Director of Caltrans, I just want to express my appreciation to uh, everybody involved in these projects. It's a fantastic collaboration, what you see here, right? Industry, the association, academia, Caltrans, uh, finding ways to innovate so aligned with our principles of, of sustainability, stewardship, putting the money to work, reducing the impacts to the traveling public safety, all of those things align with these types of projects. And so um, look forward to continued uh, innovation and, and collaboration with uh, all of these groups in the future. My thanks to all of you. Yeah. Now we'll get to our agenda. So uh, yesterday we deferred tab 21 to today. So we'll go back and see if we can pick up on tab 21. 
Thank you, Chair Eager. And just to check, can you hear me on the bias? No, not it. Okay, trying once more. Can you hear me? We can hear you, we just can't understand you. <laughs> Commissioners, can you hear me from the staff table? Do we wanna try that with Bridget? Or should I just keep talking? Okay. I'm gonna leave my mic on while technical difficulties are resolved. Go ahead. Oh, okay, sorry, you need me to keep talking. Okay. Okay, so tab 21 commissioners is going to be an informational item. Tony Dang, Deputy Director for Sustainability at Caltrans is going to present an update on Caltrans Complete Streets activities. And with that, I will turn it over to Tony. Thanks, Laura. Can you guys hear me in the room okay? Okay, let's give it a try. I'll, I'll do my best. So uh, good morning, Chair Eager and Commissioners, Tony Zhang, Deputy Director for Sustainability at Caltrans. Uh, and we are very grateful to have the opportunity to report on some of the progress that we have made in advancing complete streets in our work. Uh, and I guess I should wait for the slides to come up. <laughs> Uh, can I next slide, please? So we are particularly proud of the momentum that we have made in recent years, uh, including our partnership with the commission to establish the $100 million complete straight streets reservation in the 2020 shop. Uh, the release of our new director's policy on complete streets at the end of 2021 uh, that directs our project teams to provide comfortable, convenient, and connected facilities for people walking, biking, and taking transit or passenger rail. Uh, and most recently, the development and release of our complete streets action plan in June of 2022 that identifies high priority actions that will be needed to fully implement our new complete streets policy. Next slide. Now the Complete Streets Action Plan contains uh, nearly 50 high priority actions that the department is committed to delivering through the end of 2023. Unfortunately, I won't have the time to walk through all the great work that the department is committed to accomplishing, uh, but I wanna thank the commission uh, to, uh, for providing us the opportunity to highlight just a handful of the actions uh, from the Complete Streets Action Plan that really demonstrate our commitment to walking, biking, transit, and rail. I should also note that while we are utilizing the action plan to help structure and monitor our complete streets priorities uh, within the department, we are absolutely committed to seizing new and emerging opportunities to integrate complete streets in our projects as they arise. Next slide. So the first action we wanted to highlight is our California Integrated Travel Project or CalITP. So through this, pro uh, through the CalITP, uh, we are helping to streamline processes for transit agencies to be able to procure equipment and software to support real-time departure and arrival information, as well as open contactless payment systems. Uh, overall, our goal with CalITP is to equip every transit vehicle in the state with this technology in order to promote seamless travel across transit districts uh, in California. 
Uh, to date, Cal ITP has been successful in working with the Department of General Services to award two categories of master services agreements that support the procurement of contactless payment technologies. And we currently have eight agencies across California that have been able to utilize these MSAs and are currently in implementation phases with it. We are also providing technical assistance to more than 50 uh, additional transit agencies to implement this technology. I also wanted to take a moment to underscore how trailblazing the work of Cal ITP is because the solutions that we are spearheading and have made available to uh, California transit agencies are also available to transit agencies nationwide. And we already have uh, a few transit agencies outside of California uh, leveraging the uh, procurement um, solutions that we've put forth through the Cal ITP. Next slide. The next action we wanted to highlight is an example of how seriously our districts are committed to Complete Streets implementation. So here you'll see that in San Diego and Imperial counties, under the leadership of District 11 Director Gustavo de Yarda, the district has set its own voluntary target uh, for investing in uh, Complete Streets through its Shop Minor B budget. Uh, the investments to date have represented roughly 10 uh, to 15 percent of uh, the district's minor uh, B budget, and this is on top of uh, other investments that the district is uh, making in complete streets and active transportation. Next slide. The next action we're very excited to highlight is our work exploring the development of standard guidance to support the deployment of quick build and temporary demonstration projects on the state highway system. So these types of projects can be used as a tool for, for testing different project elements and designs prior to the installation of permanent infrastructure. And we also believe that these types of quick build or temporary demonstration projects also support more robust community engagement and conversations on the designs of the projects that we implement. So to help inform the development of this standard statewide uh, guidance, we have a number of different pilots underway uh, currently, uh, including up in District 1. We are planning for a pop-up demonstration uh, project in uh, Eureka, currently slated for May of this year. And then we've also been selected as one of three state departments of transportation uh, to work with the Smart Growth America Complete Streets Leadership Academy. And through that program, we'll be working with the cities of uh, Berkeley, San Leandro, and South San Francisco to implement three uh, quick build and temporary demonstration projects on Caltrans facilities uh, in this calendar year. Next slide. We're also very excited to report that the Caltrans of the, the Division of Design has made significant progress in developing what we're terming contextual uh, guidance. So this guidance will take the form of a design information bulletin, and it will be setting forth minimum expectations for different complete streets facilities uh, by uh, place type and roadway context. We, the Design Information Bulletin will also hopefully streamline design and approval processes uh, for complete speech projects in applicable areas. Uh, I should note that the application of these new standards will be optional, but we really do believe that this DIB will allow for greater flexibility uh, for our own project teams as well as our partners uh, in designing complete streets facilities on the state highway system. Uh, for projects that do uh, elect to utilize these new uh, standards in urban, suburban, or rural main street place types, one of the most exciting aspects is that for uh, bicyclists, it sets the facilities uh, which provide the most separation for bicyclists as the starting point and preferred facility type. Uh, we, Caltrans, are, is in the process of circulating a, a draft of this uh, new contextual guidance to our agency and uh, non-governmental organization partners in the coming weeks uh, to seek input and feedback, uh, including through our walk and bike technical advisory committee, uh, which includes local, regional, and state agency partners, uh, advocates, and uh, community-based organizations. Next slide. We also recognize that our own workforce needs to be trained uh, and up to the task of delivering our Complete Streets vision. So to that end, uh, over the last year, we've worked to develop and roll out a new roadshow for safety, equity, and climate action training to all of our 12 uh, districts that was delivered 
uh, in the summer of last year. Uh, this training focused on how to navigate issues related to design immunity, uh, to encourage the embracing of design flexibility, and to apply the principles of safety, equity, and climate action to project design uh, so that we are developing the right project for a community. Uh, this is just one example of the training and education that we are committed to developing and providing to our employees, uh, and additional resources will be developed to support our staff in, in implementing Complete Streets. Next slide. Lastly, uh, I wanted to just take a moment to celebrate uh, the completion of all 12 of the Caltrans Active Transportation Plans. Uh, this was a multi-year effort that created active trans transportation plans in each of our 12 districts, and each of the plans identifies key bicycle and pedestrian needs on or across the state highway system. Each of these plans was developed with extensive public engagement with community residents and our transportation partners. Uh, and since their completion, the needs have uh, the needs identified within the CAT plans have been utilized to inform the shop's complete streets funding and performance targets. Uh, beyond implementing projects uh, to address these needs within the shop, uh, we are also supporting our districts to identify uh, opportunities to pursue state and federal discretionary funding to, to further support the implementation of Complete Streets projects uh, addressing these community identified needs. Next slide. Well, I, I know that that was a whirlwind of information, uh, but I hope that goes to show uh, that Caltrans is moving full steam ahead with mainstreaming complete streets in our work. Uh, and with that, I thank you for your time and happy to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you, Vice Chair Gardino. Thank you, Chair Eager. Tony, that was an excellent report. I may have heard it wrong. So uh, early on your slides, it mentioned that there were 100 million for complete streets out of the shop. Are we limited to that 100 million? If so, is that statutory? Can that ever be a conversation for uh, adjustment? I know there's a lot of um, uh, pressures on that program, but the more that we can be designing all of our streets to be complete streets, in my humble opinion, the better. Yeah, so the $100 million reservation was um, for the 2020 shop, and it was a stopgap measure as we worked to develop a, a data-driven process for how we um, invest in complete streets through the shop moving forward. So uh, that last slide that I mentioned around the CAT plans being utilized to inform um, uh, funding for complete streets in the shop um, uh, for the uh, 2022 and 2024 um, uh, shops, I believe that we are investing much more than $100 million in complete streets. I don't have the exact uh, number off the top of my head, but happy to, uh, to follow up if that's helpful. And with apologies, it's not you, Tony, but the sound system we're in, it's, it's hard to hear the speakers on the dais. M Mike, perhaps you can expand on that, and, and apologies again that, that my ears yeah. aren't working as well as I'd like. Yeah, thank you uh, for the opportunity. I'll, I'll, uh, the 100 million was in reference to the 2020 shop. And if you may recall, that was sort of a stop gap uh, to say that we're going to do a special process to invest. But the, um, the, the CAT plans, the active transportation plans that we have now, all 12 districts have those. So we'll be implementing those plans into our shop and we'll be in fact there'll be a presentation later by mike johnson on the shsmp to kind of share all of the investments that we'll be making but there'll be substantially more than 100 million dollars going toward this in the future thank you that's really helpful and well done yes commissioner lou Thank you for the presentation, Tony, even despite the fact it was a little hard to understand you, but uh, from what we could hear, it did all sound really <laughs> good. And um, congratulations, I understand that you're leaving us for Oakland. Yeah, so yes, I have a I couple am. of questions, <laughs> and now that you're not gonna come back to us, you can be brutally honest. <laughs> I'm focusing on the, the one aspect of the uh, Complete Streets Action Plan, and that was the creation of a benefit cost um, tool for active transportation program uh, projects. And my understanding is that that 
tool has been finalized, was developed with the help of, of UC Davis and their team, I assume their ITS team. And um, they wrote the technical documentation for the tool, but when you look at it, there's a big gap. There's no, they, they weren't able to monetize the benefits of active transportation projects. And I've been told that there's going to be a phase two of this process where the, the benefit cost tool will in, monetize the benefits. Uh, you know, obviously the, the things like, uh, you know, the benefits you get from exercising, the, the benefits you get from less congestion, the, the air quality benefits and all those things. Um, it's a lot of public health benefits. So I guess my questions to you are, is it true that you're, we're gonna be able to get a tool that monetizes the benefits of active transportation uh, projects? Because I think that's really vital for us to, to be able to sell you know, the need for continued funding to active transportation programs. And if, if so, when can we expect it? So um, I'm going to defer to my colleagues in the Division of Local Assistance that are uh, managing uh, the research team um, for this project. Uh, but I, I think uh, what I can offer is maybe a potential follow-up meetings uh, to sit down with you to kind of discuss the technical uh, details that the research team is working on. We lost you, Tony. Someone's coming up. Is that phone a friend? Can you hear me? Ah, there you go. My name is Kathy McKeown. I'm the office chief for the Office of State Programs in the Division of Local Assistance. Uh, the Active Transportation Program, as well as the ATRC, falls under my uh, division. We are the ones who did the contract with UC Davis. Um, it was actually through, um, leaded by Dylan Fitch. He's the co-director for the Bicycling Plus Research Collaborative, UC Davis Institute of Transportation Studies. And um, yes, the initial contract that was that developed the BC tool was completed in July of 2022, and the current tool does calculate the benefits of the project segments. The output of the current tools is a large table of quantitative project-specific benefit calculations, including average daily bicyclists and pedestrians, safety benefits, expected increases in walking and bicycling, and downstream benefits from new active transportation, physical activity, VMT, GHG reduction. It also includes a qualitative description of other potential social benefits that are not project specific, but are supported in academic literature. And the, um, we do have a link to that. Uh, you can do a search online. Um, we are coordinating with the UC Davis uh, for a shared BC tool continuation proposal with the CTC staff, as well as UC Davis. Um, and currently revising the proposal. As for the improvements, the next phase would include the validation of the tool, which is yet to be tested, um, improvements to the safety calculations, monetization of the quantitative benefits, and added functionality to calculate the entire program level benefits, which would be the multiple project sum. Um, we, and we are working with that currently. We don't anticipate that that will be something that would be finalized, the proposal, until fall of 2023. And um, we are still working with UC Davis on determining what the timeframes would be. But um, we're working with DPAC, and when you do that, it, they have very specific timeframes. They won't, you know, I think that we are ending our ability to submit a proposal contract as of yesterday. Okay. So I, I would ask that you, you keep me in the loop, but also our, our active transportation staff uh, so they can, you know, have some feedback into that, too. I, I'm really glad to see this happening. I coined a new phrase on Twitter that it pays to invest in active transportation, and I'm hoping you can prove me right. We do, and, and we do work extremely closely with the CTC staff, the, the ATP staff. They, they really direct the work. Um, we come to them with proposals. We discuss it. We also bring it forward to the TAC, and um, you know, we, we, we take their lead. Yeah, I, I, I think this is, all, this is all great. I wish it could happen yesterday, but um, I, it's, uh, I'm really glad to see that it is, it is happening. You're committed to putting dollar figures on it at some point. 
right? however hard that might be. And I know it's not a perfect science when it comes to that, but I think it's going to be helpful. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Any other commissioners have questions, comments? Director Weiss. Yeah, uh, I, I have a, a few questions, but I guess I want to start, I guess I know I want to start off by saying I really appreciate this work. Um, this is really important for, for people who are biking and walking. Um, you know, as someone who, who has commuted by bicycle a long time, um, I know not, not only it, can it be dangerous on the state highway system, but the where the state highway system interacts with local road systems can be extremely dangerous. So I'm, I'm really excited by this. Um, I have a few questions. You mentioned the, the quick build uh, projects. Do you know through what program that's being funded? We are- uh, I can probably talking answer that much. The quick build for the off system is handled by the ATRC. For the on system though. Sorry. Can you guys hear me in the room? So. We'll, we'll work on getting that, Tony. Yeah. Um, okay. The other question, um, two questions. One, well, one, I, I, I heard a little something about uh, complete streets elements completed by grants that I didn't quite get it, so I was hoping to get clarification, but I don't think I'll be able to if we can't hear you at all. Uh, and then the, the third thing is um, one of the things that has been talked about is identifying mm -hmm. the most dangerous places on the state highway system for, for cyclists and pedestrians. Um, and I think that's important for us to look at both in terms of, of gross numbers, but also relative to the to volumes if we have that data. And so I would love if we can get a report on that at some point in the very near future. Mike? Thank you. Uh, let the record show he nodded yes. <laughs> and, and Tony on his way out, he's vigorously nodding yes. <laughs> Thank you. Do we have any public comment on this uh, item? I see no public comment at this time. Thank you. Thank you. So, I believe we are on tab 23. Douglas, tell me if I'm wrong. I'm good, okay, tab 23. Okay, commissioners, this is going to be an informational item. Stuart Markham, who is the acting office chief for the Office of Biological Science and Innovation uh, from Caltrans Division of Environmental Assistance is going to present an update on the 2022 advanced mitigation report. With that, I will welcome Stuart. All right, uh, I'd like to thank the commission and um, commissioners and staff for this opportunity to present Talking, on- Are we trying to get Stuart online? Uh, can you hear me? So I need to keep talking? Can you- I mean, I'm happy to. <laughs> Can you hear me at all? We can hear you. Okay, okay. Um, if, if I could get the the PowerPoint presentation up. I had previously uh, thanked the commission and the commissioners and staff for uh, the opportunity to present uh, Caltrans Advanced Mitigation uh, Program uh, 22, 2022 annual report to the commission. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, our program was created in 2017 through uh, two acts of legislation, uh, the first one being uh, AB, or SB1, um, the Road Repair and Accountability Act, which established a program and also the budget trailer bill for that year, SB103, and one provision with, within uh, the act um, required- Tony, we're having trouble understanding you. <laughs> And, and so the, the act uh, created um, has one provision in which Caltrans is, re is uh, required to report to the, to the commission on the activity within the advanced mitigation account. Um, 
And as we established our guidelines, we also um, um, came into agreement with the commission that we would uh, also report on the transportation projects that are potentially using our mitigation, as well as what mitigation is available. Stuart, um, we're having trouble hearing you. Next slide, please. Stuart, we're having, we're having trouble hearing you, Stuart. All right. Um, are you able to hear me now? Can you hear me? Chair, if we could pause a minute, we're not getting the sound into the webinar currently from the room. Okay. Tim, we'd like you to just dance for a minute while they do the song. Okay. Done. It's, I, I have we're good now. Oh, man, he was just starting to dance. <laughs> Can everyone hear me okay? Yes, we would like to switch this up and we would turn in March. We'll bring it back in March. Stuart, we're going to move on from your presentation and we'll, we'll see you at another meeting, hopefully in March. All right, thank you. Thank you, Stuart. Sorry. Tim. Thank you, Chair Eager. Commissioners, item 53 is an action item to approve the terms, conditions, and execution of a long term airspace lease with EDPR California Solar Park LLC and EDPR California Solar Park 2 LLC. As mentioned yesterday, EDPR is a company specializing in renewable energy. The company wishes in, to enter into a long-term airspace lease across State Route 99 in Kern County for the purposes of having overhead transmission lines that will connect their solar farm to PG&E's power grid. As I said, this item was related to the action taken yesterday to receive approval to directly negotiate with a private entity. Typically, the request would be held subs at a subsequent meeting However, due to unforeseen circumstance, where a moratorium was identified late in the process, where pg &E <coughs> cannot perform this type of work between March and October, Caltrans has requested to hear this item today so the work can be completed in February of this year. This action requires unanimous vote of the commission from the commissioners present at the meeting. Staff has reviewed this request and recommends the approval of the terms, conditions, and execution of the airspace lease. Thank you, Tim. Do we have any questions or concerns from our commissioners? Yes, Commissioner Bedshaw. Yeah, this is kind of picking up a little more from uh, what I talked about yesterday, but just with, with the PG&E moratorium, can we get a little more information on that? Because again, at the public service, so to speak, but private entity has an internal moratorium, is my understanding, uh, in the months you identified. And what's what's driving that, Tim? Why why is there such a limit to when they can do the transmission work? I think uh, Caltrans is in the room to help explain a little bit more detail of of their coordination with both PG&E and the property or the private entity. I know Diana was here a minute ago. And, and just for clarity, when I when I was referencing the private ent entity, uh, I'm talking about PG&E as well. Yeah. Yeah, I don't believe PG e is here, but nope, sure they're not. You know, one of the things that we had discussed when we were looking at this, and I know Tim was on the call too, um, in the Central Valley, for those of you who have been in the Central Valley in the summer, um, it gets uh, really, really warm, sure. and um, the wires can move up and down depending on whether it's 85 degrees or 120. And so um, PG&E, and, &E, and I'll, I'm speaking from my economic development hat now, and when we try to get them in to do some of the work, that's their time period that they don't do that work. Um, so if somebody has something different than that, you can speak now or forever hold your peace, but I know that's what they told us from a development standpoint. And it, that was my understanding as well, and that's so for that season till October. Um, um, based on the electricity grid, they don't do that work. And we didn't want to lose a whole cycle. Oh, fortunately, we have stalled long enough that yeah. Diana's coming in the room. 
Diana, yeah. we were speaking on your behalf, but now you can speak. <laughs> I, I really appreciate the uh, comments, my fellow commissioners, and I have no doubt that that's at least part of it, but uh, I'll, I'll hear the answer from there. What was the question? Sorry. But why what, was it, the, what was the, the good question? Yeah, so in talking to PG&E, mm -hmm. the moratorium, what's the reason for it? Well, <clears throat> they don't allow working on on their transmission lines they won't do any work or allow for work during these months because the possibility of having to shut off power during the summer times and so we can all the construction can proceed but if we do not get them connected we'll miss an entire summer of using this additional power and part of it was the heat in the summer too. yeah the heat in the summertime so these new solar this new solar farm will add um, a significant amount of power to the grid which will help with the rolling blackout so whatever more we can add to the system not our system but the pg and e network will really help out um, with the usage of power throughout the state or in the central valley and i was explaining to commissioner bradshaw that from a developer, economic developer standpoint, um, we try to get PG&E before the summer months and after um, because they have a real issue too in the Central Valley and because of their lines and what happens during those summer months when it's 120, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, there's I mean, there's a significant amount of strain on their network in the summertime. And this is in you know one of the hottest parts of the state in Kern County. And so they will not allow for any work on their transmission lines after mm -hmm. uh, March. And then we'd have to wait till October. They would have to wait till October. Mm -hmm. So yeah, again, I, I understand all that. Part of why I raise it, and th thank you. Um, part of why I raise it is across industry, public and private, PG&E is all the time now running into capacity problems to perform the work. And whether you're talking about housing, uh, commercial, uh, anything and obviously it's heavy infrastructure and, and power grid, uh, all very important, certainly a big proponent of uh, bringing capacity to it. I think there was a key word there, uh, pg e it's their system. You draw whatever conclusion you might like from that, anybody, but um, that's why I want a little more on it because constantly hearing issues in the general construction field about problems with capacity of pg e to get the work done. That's why I brought it up, thanks. So Commissioner Bradshaw was also discussed that um, it might be good for us to have a separate meeting with PG&E to talk about their processes and how that intertwines with the work that we're trying to do. So um, maybe staff could set that meeting up so that uh, we can have that conversation with them. Thanks, Chair Eager. I'd happily uh, join that committee. Thank you, Diana. Any other questions? I'd like to, if I may, I'd like to move. Uh, Second, like Martinez. <laughs> Thank you, Michelle. <laughs> Vice Chair Gardino and <laughs> Commissioner Martinez. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. <laughs> move along. Tab 54. Casey. Uh, good morning, Commissioners. Tab 54 is an informational item. Senate Bill 1 requires the Transportation Inspector General to provide an annual summary report of investigations, audit findings, and recommendations to the Governor, the Legislature, and the Commission. The current report covers the period of July 1st, 2021 through June 30th, 2022. 23 audit reports were issued, which includes three performance audits and 20 compliance audits. Um, commission staff review the annual report and work with the responsible Caltrans program on corrective action plans as appropriate. More specifically, as it relates to the performance audits, commission staff has worked with Caltrans to evaluate and appropriately address the findings of the baseline for Senate Bill 1 performance outcome bridges and the Senate Bill 1 1920 efficiencies audits. Caltrans has made improvements to address the audit findings and subsequent year reports. I also want to acknowledge a few questions received from the commissioners. Commissioner Liu has asked, 
why we continue to award funds to any entity that has been found to owe Caltrans money. And Commissioner Martinez has asked if the report reflects Caltrans actions, what happens after the Department of Finance review, and how the issues are resolved, and is the resolution tracked or reported in any way. Staff have reached out to Caltrans, and we will be providing written responses. And so with that, Inspector General Brian Beyer is here in person with a more detailed presentation of the report to share with you. Good morning. <clears throat> well, my name is Brian Beyer. I'm the Inspector General for the Independent Office of Audits and Investigations for Caltrans. And I'm really pleased to be here in front of you and to see you in person and to present uh, our annual report. Next slide, please. I thought I'd start off with uh, a few of our key statutory requirements. As you know, Santa Bill 1 uh, created my position in my office, uh, but really our statutory requirements reside in the government code, uh, sections 14.460 through 14.463, uh, and also in 14.110. Uh, I know that's really exciting for everybody. Uh, but the, the first one that I, that I wanted to point out is we're, we're required to conduct audits uh, and reviews to ensure state and federal transportation funds are spent efficiently, effectively, economically, and in compliance with applicable state and federal requirements. We're also required to conduct investigations of employee misconduct. And third, we are uh, required to review Caltrans's outreach efforts to increase procurement opportunities for small and disadvantaged business enterprises. And finally, uh, we, we have to provide a summary each year to the governor, the legislature, and to the commission. Uh, next slide, please. Basically what we do is we do performance audits. Those are essentially larger type uh, audits from our from our perspective uh, they assess the extent to which legislative regulatory or programmatic goals and objectives are being achieved and determine if caltrans has adequate controls in place to manage its programs we also conduct compliance audits uh, we call them project audits sometimes cost incurred audits they have many names they all do the same thing uh, but in these types of audits, we determine whether project costs claimed and reimbursed are allowable, reasonable, and adequately supported in compliance with agreement provisions, state and federal laws and regulations, and to determine whether projects delivered the expected benefits. Now, those two types of audits, the performance and compliance, we do in accordance with government auditing standards. Uh, it's also known as the Yellow Book but we do other types of review services that are not part of our yellow book. And we, we distinguish them, them from, from audits. We call them not audit services. Uh, these include the reviews of architectural and engineering cost proposals and reviews of local government indirect cost rate proposals. And finally, we conduct investigations, mostly from an administrative point of view, but on occasion, uh, some of these allegations uh, have a criminal element to them uh, and what we generally do is refer those matters to a local or to a, an appropriate law enforcement entity when that when that happens sometimes we assist that entity uh, going forward from there next slide please a brief overview of our investigative activity uh, last fiscal year we received 218 new allegations we closed 104 of them and substantiated 11 of them. And as you can see on the map, it's a kind of a distribution of, by district. Uh, but on the next slide, uh, there's a little bit more detail. And I, this is probably hard to read for everybody in the back here. Uh, so I'll try to go over some of the highlights here, but there's two charts. The one on the left uh, shows a distribution of the 218 allegations by type of allegation. And the largest one that we receive generally is incompatible activities or conflicts of interest. The next largest bar is misuse of state resources, followed by improper hiring practices, and then general EEO related matters. The chart on the right uh, is more or less the same thing as the map. It shows allegations by district. 
uh, and of course headquarters as well. And to be clear, these are uh, allegations that em where employees reside in those districts or that or in headquarters. Uh, next slide, please. In terms of our audits, uh, we issued 23 audit reports. They included 72 recommendations and with a potential financial impact of $21 million. And I'll go into that a little bit more in, uh, in a minute. Uh, as far as the types of audits, we did three performance audits at 20 compliance. Those 20 comprised of nine from local agencies, four that were Proposition 1B related, and then seven contract compliance audits. Next slide, please. In terms of the financial impact, uh, we have two different categories. We have question costs and then avoided costs. Uh, a question cost is, is something that actually happened that we have determined uh, didn't meet some requirement. Sometimes the, those uh, expenditures aren't supported by records. Sometimes that we just find them unallowable based on uh, the, the, the type of requirement that we're checking. Uh, in all, we found $6.9 million worth of question costs out of a total audited cost of $437 million. So I wanted to make sure that there's context when you see a large dollar amount like 21 million, that you understand that it's really based on the total dollars that we audit, which is about $1.3 billion. So that's a, uh, an important contextual element that I wanted to make sure everybody realizes. In terms of avoided costs, uh, we have uh, 13.7 million. And avoided costs is a little bit different because those are costs that, that would have occurred had we not found some uh, modification to an indirect cost uh, rate or a direct cost uh, proposal. Uh, next slide, please. In terms of our non-audit services, uh, we did 220 reviews of architectural and engineering cost proposals. 115 reviews of local agency indirect cost rates and 16 reviews of local agency single audit findings and corrective actions. Uh, next slide, please. So last year we recommended, or I had 72 new recommendations and of those 72, 45 remain uh, open at the moment. And I did want to talk about our process of once we issue a recommendation. I know that's a topic that I, I've heard uh, some questions about. Uh, we issue an audit report with recommendations. Generally, the department has a response uh, that's included in our, in our public report that sometimes addresses them immediately. Uh, but we follow up with the department on a 60-day basis, then six months, and then every year until, until the recommendation is resolved in some, some manner. And we consider an open recommendation one that hasn't been resolved yet. So a closed recommendation, we have validated, we, the department has responded uh, to our recommendation and we validated it to, uh, to the extent that we feel that they've implemented it. Uh, next slide, please. So this chart is uh, really shows how those open recommendations uh, divide between the Caltrans responsible entity. And of course, one stands out more than the others, but there's a reason for that. So the, the division of local assistance, uh, we use that division because most of our recommendations do pertain to local entities. And so we have a, a common uh, uh, entity there to, to, uh, to keep track of them. But in the four fiscal years that we've, we've tracked here, uh, there's 129 open recommendations. Uh, 45 in the most recent year, like I mentioned before, 53 in fiscal year 2021, there's 29 open recommendations in 1920, and two open recommendations in 1819. So the good news is those, those recommendations do close over a period of time. Uh, this is an area that we, we have some uh, significant interest. Uh, we are uh, actively working with Caltrans. I work very, very closely with the director uh, and the chief deputy. Uh, so these are things that we have uh, on our mind all the time. Uh, next slide, please. 
I also wanted to point out some significant operational changes that occurred in 2022 for, for my office. Uh, this is my first year as Inspector General. Uh, obviously, we made some changes, very proud of some of these changes. Uh, but one of the big ones is a creation of a new diversity and small, <clears throat> excuse, excuse me, diversity and small and disadvantaged business enterprise team. So this is related to the mandate of SB 103, which requires our review of Caltrans outreach activities for procurement. Uh, we've really structured, restructured this so that we have a standalone dedicated team that will conduct a perpetual audit of this program. Uh, our first report is uh, anxiously uh, coming out in the next couple of months. Uh, and then every year after we, we plan to produce a report on this topic. And this will essentially look at the three primary metrics of small business, disabled veteran, and disadvantaged business enterprises, as well as the outreach activities that Caltrans has done. Uh, the next one on here is uh, a creation of a new financial document review team. Uh, these really are the non-audit services that I spoke about before. And we separated this from our audit, audit, excuse me, our audit side of the house, so that this is something that's dedicated. Uh, that's uh, a team that just does these reviews. That way, our auditors don't get torn between conducting audits and then switching off to uh, these these types of reviews. It's very uh, effective for us. And then lastly, something that's still in development, but we're just beginning to hire people on, is a new business intelligence team. Uh, this will be a data analytics program for us. So what's different is we've always been a reactive office. We, we react to uh, people requesting audits or complaining about things. Uh, this is a new strategy. It's a paradigm shift for us so that we can look more proactively at, at things that are going on. So this is looking at big data uh, and doing uh, standard uh, uh, data analytics so we can look at problematic transactions before they become uh, real problems. So we're very excited about that. Uh, next slide, please. Each year we have an audit plan. And an audit plan is essentially a tool that we use uh, to uh, plan out what, what types of projects, what types of audits that, that are important to us. And what I wanted to leave you with is some key things that are on our mind. Of course, a lot of federal funding is hitting. Uh, so making sure that we choose projects that involved uh, federal funding is, is one of our top priorities. Um, we're also, of course, gonna continue our look at SB1 performance metrics, the efficiencies that Caltrans is producing each, each year. Uh, we're also, of course, looking at uh, very closely our SB103 mandate with small and, and uh, disadvantaged businesses. And then finally, we're trying to expand our, our look with our compliance audits. We're making sure that we have a, a good geographic distribution of the types of projects that we, that we choose. Next slide, please. And I'm happy, to, that, that concludes my presentation. I'm happy to take any of your questions. Thank you. Any commissioners have questions? Director Weiss. Oh, I, I just wanted to, to thank Brian and his team for work, particularly uh, they've been responsive uh, over the years when the commission has had specific questions or issues that, that we need to, to be looked into in a greater depth than, than we have the capacity to. And then also in relation to, to Caltrans's work towards the uh, SB1 performance targets, um, you know, it, it's super helpful. There have been a couple of times where we don't always agree, but but we're at least able, able to make informed decisions based on the great work that you guys have done. So thank you. Commissioner Liu. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so the issue that Casey mentioned is that when I look at this report each year, I keep seeing that there are entities that you have found owe Caltrans money and, and those cases remain open year after year after year. And so I'm, I, I have an idea, but I have a question first. How hard is it, would it be for our staff to figure out whether a case is open at a particular time? Is that readily? Actually, very easy, you can certainly reach out and talk to us, uh, but each year as part of our annual report, all of our open recommendations are, are listed in the report, so you should be yeah. able to find which ones have, have dollar amounts attached to them. But we would be happy to generate a list for you as well. And I think you said like, 
after a year or two, they start really going down in the number. I would like to know, and I don't know how difficult this would be for staff, but as we make decisions, if you could flag for us, if the people we are awarding money to have open cases for more than a year with the Office of Inspector General, and then provide you know some background information like they do for each of these cases, just the basic stuff, the type of the, the thing, the amount, and um, a summary, uh, the date, it, how long it's been open, the date since it was been open. Would you be able to do that, or is that just way too much work for you? Casey, am I able to do that? Um, flagging the entities that have open cases on the allocations may be difficult, but I do have for you, which will be part of the written response, um, the list of open cases, the status, and where they are. Yeah, I know that, but I mean, for me, I don't know. When we're, Other, so it's, it's if, kind of like after the fact, it's like, oh, we just awarded so someone a bunch we, of money and they've owed, you know, supposedly, since it's determined by the inspector general, they've owed Caltrans millions of dollars for many years. So we, we have the list. I think there, we, we can probably get that updated with each commission meeting. Um, and I think that might put some, uh, some encourage, encourage some of our partners to resolve these more quickly. I know there are a couple that have been on there for a while and one of them has been resolved, I think since the report was done and the other one they're, they're working on resolving. Right, I, I just think it may change the way I vote on things. If I know that there's been a case that, you know, millions of dollars are at play for many, many years and it's just not getting resolved, that might change yeah, the well, way I and, vote. And I, I, get, I mean, to be fair, so there, there are times when the, the audit team has a finding. Right, and, 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 the and they have to go and, through and, a process and it takes a long time because Caltrans well, is saying and, one thing. And, and, they, and the Caltrans you know, area doesn't always concur yeah. with whether the findings should be repaid. And, and, you know, and I would like to have that information too before I, I make a decision, but it just seems to me that, you know, uh, kind of because it's happened year after year, that I'm kind of reaching the, the limits of my tolerance on these things. Yes, and um, so we can get that, but I also see my team is really anxious to say something else, yes, probably to please, correct let me. Them do that. So Teresa is supporting us here, and I appreciate you, Teresa and Casey, on this one. Um, we can provide that kind of information. It may take us some time to streamline it in. We can um, work and look through the accountability and transparency guidelines. We can work through the Inspector General's office to identify those different things. Um, one of the things to Director Weiss's point, though, that will have to be part of that discussion is where we are in the process of the audit, whether the agency is being responsive and we're still working through that process or whether we're at the end and we have a larger kind of nuclear issue. And I think how we how we determine those things and how, how you consider them might impact what, what your, your position is at the time we're allocating. Thank you. I, that is just a piece of information that I think would help me make better decisions. Thank you, Commissioner Liu, and I think, Tanisha, thank you for jumping in there. Um, if I heard you correctly, uh, what you're requesting is those timely reports saying, where are we now, what's changed, <clears throat> what's the reasons for moving ahead or not moving ahead, and we get those on a regular basis, not waiting till the end of the year to say that's been resolved or it hasn't. Thank you. Any other questions, from commissioners? Okay, thank you. Do we have any public comment? We have no public comment at this time, thank you. Thank you. And I do wanna apologize um, for tab 53. I forgot to ask if there was any public comment for tab 53. So we don't wanna have to come back next time and say we missed one. Okay, thank you. And I know we have uh, someone from Energias de Portugal here in the room. So we wanna thank you for, for being here um, in case we had any questions, but uh, we appreciate your work in helping us get uh, those uh, power lines across 99 to the people who need it. So thank you so much for being here. Um, we are at tab 55 now, Tim. Yeah, 55 and 56. Thank you. Tab 55 is an informational item. 
Caltrans is here to give an overview of their facility-related activities <clears throat> in the 2022 State Highway Operations and Protection, Protection Program. Mike Johnson, Caltrans Statewide Asset Management Engineer, and I believe Shannon Similai will be here virtually. Uh, she's the Division Chief of Business Operations. I'll turn it over to them. Good morning, Chair Eager and Commissioners. Um, <clears throat> yesterday I was watching virtually and I, I've never hoped for delay, but um, I was hoping we were gonna get to today so I could be here in person. And with the sound system, I'm so glad uh, that that happened. Um, <laughs> so thank you. Um, you're gonna get me for this presentation as well as the next one on the State Highway System Management Plan. This is kind of like a spotlight dance. It's one asset class within the broader plan. Um, uh, and as Tim mentioned, I'll be co-presenting uh, with Shannon Similai, who does our office buildings within Caltrans. Shannon's virtual. Uh, we have a backup plan. If the audio doesn't work, she's going to text responses really quickly to any questions you may have. Uh, with that, next slide, please. Um, so the commission had asked us to uh, provide kind of an overview of, of facilities within the shop and uh, I know there's a number of new members, so I wanted to start with the basics. You know, what kind of facilities are in there? We have, uh, as you can see, a lot of maintenance stations are part of this equation, uh, as well as equipment shops, transportation laboratories, and our traffic management centers in the districts. Those top four are, in terms of the shop, what we call transportation-related facilities. In other words, they're part of the management and operation of the highway system. Um, and then in addition, the shop has roadside uh, rest area, the buildings on those, as well as commercial vehicle enforcement facilities that we um, co-locate with the California Highway Patrol. And then we have the office buildings. So collectively, that makes up kind of the landscape of buildings. Um, <clears throat> you know, you can see it's uh, approaching 600 different buildings that we are uh, tasked with, with maintaining within the shop. Next slide, please. So I think one of the things that led to this presentation was COVID and the, the shift to remote work. And I think businesses, uh, public, private, uh, you know, all over the world are facing this challenge. And I, I wanted to address this particular issue because when we think about the facilities that are in the shop, the majority of them had zero impact from COVID. In fact, some of them have seen more usage because of COVID than they saw before. Um, and so when you look at things like maintenance stations, equipment, shops, traffic management centers, all of that work has gone on in effect unimpeded because of COVID. The one area where we have seen uh, impact is on our office buildings. And obviously the shift to remote work um, has our, our buildings, uh, which as we'll get into here, some are leased, some are owned in various states of utilization. And I think this is, you know, this is a challenge that building, office building owners of, of all businesses are facing right now. Next slide. So I wanted to talk about some of the pretty amazing things we're doing in the asset management realm. Um, you know, we're about, six years in, I think that I've been in this job as asset uh, manager for Caltrans. And when, when we started and to date, all of our facilities have utilized the age of the building as a surrogate for the condition and all of the work and analysis that we do. And we've been working internally to start to migrate that over to actual condition-based assessments of all these buildings. And I'm I'm really pleased to report that we've made some significant progress here um, in, our, in the areas of our maintenance stations, roadside rest, commercial vehicle enforcement facilities. Those uh, site-specific condition assessments are now underway. Um, and once those assessments are done, uh, we'll be able to shift over to use that if, in all of our asset management work. So that will be a tremendous uh, maturation of how we're managing our buildings. And likewise, office buildings um, are also uh, getting more regular condition assessments as well. And they, the condition assessments aren't just structural. We're looking at you know HVAC system, plumbing systems, electrical, and other things 
and really is the is the building fit for purpose um, so they're quite complex in terms of uh, their assessment and as you can see we have some 600 five 600 buildings that we need to carry these in, these assessments out with but we are we are getting to a better place and and i think in the near future we will have significantly better asset management than just age-based um next slide please um, I wanted to just show some of the 2022 shop project highlights, not to get into the project specifics, but to show the nature of the work that you all have approved within the 2022 shop. And in the area of our transportation related facilities and office buildings, um, you know, 20, 28 projects, about $460 million. Um, you can see, I just pulled off four or five of the bigger ones. Uh, but predominantly maintenance stations and labs. I mean, this is where the bulk of the investment is occurring. Um, I think the maintenance stations in particular, there's a large number of them. And, and for a number of years, I think um, uh, improvements of those have been deferred for other highway improvements. And we're now at a point where we need to kind of swing that pendulum back a bit. Next slide. Uh, similarly, roadside rests. Um, these are obviously a important interface for the traveling public. Um, they they do provide safety because they allow our uh, commercial operators to get off the road, get a nap, use a restroom, as well as you know those of us uh, traveling on those routes. Um, again, uh, 13 projects, uh, close to 200 million dollars. Uh, the four the four biggest ones are shown there up on the screen. Next slide, please. And then I mentioned the commercial vehicle enforcement facilities. And so these are generally combined with the scale or weigh in motion scales for commercial vehicles. Uh, we have six projects, about $71 million, uh, and a couple of big ones that are showing there in District 7 and 8. Um, these really, these facilities, as we are able to upgrade them and modernize them, really speed our ability to move freight around California. Next slide. Okay, so this is where I had planned to have Shannon start talking about office buildings. Um, I don't know if we want to give it a try, but I feel like we should. Uh, Shannon, do you want to see how your audio works? Are, are we able to get Shannon on remotely? Yeah. Let's give it a try. Maybe the challenge is Brandy doesn't have enough screens in front of her. Fifth one will get <laughs> Can I, I'm just checking to see if I can be heard. Can the commission hear me? Shannon Simulai. We, we can hear you, we're just not quite sure we'll understand you, but you can start, we'll, we'll see if we can. Very good, I will do my very best. Uh, thank you and good morning. Uh, Shannon Similai, the Division Chief of Caltrans Business Operations. As Michael uh, mentioned earlier, I'm responsible for the office building here within Caltrans. Um, and I appreciate the opportunity to give today's presentation. Next slide, please. Okay. Office buildings comprise a significant portion of the capital investment within Caltrans overall facilities portfolio. There are 12 district offices and the Sacramento headquarters, all of which encompass approximately 3.3 million square feet. For comparison, that's roughly about 76 acres. The maintenance responsibilities of these buildings fall into four areas. Caltrans solely maintained and operated districts, which is Eureka, District 1, District 5, San Luis Obispo, and District 9 in Bishop. Then we have facilities that are solely operated and maintained by DGS, which is District 3, Marysville, and District 11, San Diego. Then our next category is Caltrans jointly maintained facilities, which are jointly between Caltrans and the Department of General Services. Those are the primary of our uh, districts, which is in District 2, Reading, District 4, Oakland, District 6, Fresno, District 7, Los Angeles, 8, 
in Riverside, 10 in Stockton, and then in headquarters. Our last district is District 12, which is a leased building. Next slide, please. In fiscal year 21-22, office building expenses and encumbrances were approximately $92.6 million, with the majority of those funds going towards DGS services, bond payments, and lease costs. Approximately 10, 10 million was used on building maintenance needs and projects. Office building projects that exceed the funding capacity of the annual maintenance budget may be pursued through the shop. As displayed on this slide, the 2022 shop includes a District 4 Oakland project for cooling tower and chiller replacement at a projected cost of just over 4.5 million. As also mentioned earlier, uh, we are conducting facility condition assessments at uh, seven of Caltrans older buildings. The last facility condition assessments were conducted in 2017 and 19. And so it's time to renew those and get updated information. Additionally, seismic reevaluations were conducted and we are expecting the final reports on those at the end of January, 2023. As mentioned earlier in the presentation, this information and data derived from these evaluations contributes towards the new condition-based approach of identifying the state of building assets. Next slide, please. Caltrans continues to monitor and evaluate our evolving space issues, uses, I'm sorry, and needs in the hybrid telework environment. And we will adjust as appropriate to ensure our efficient and effective stewardship of the state's resources remains a top priority. Much has been learned through the last couple of years, which has allowed us to build upon the successes and learn how to adjust or modify through the cha challenges encountered. By adopting a hybrid telework environment, Caltrans has relinquished nearly 10,000, I'm sorry, 100,000 square feet of leased office space statewide by consolidating approximately 450 staff into existing office buildings, thereby resulting in expense reductions of nearly $2.7 million. Those funds are now available to be reinvested into our existing office buildings to offset recent significant cost increases in materials and equipment and contractor fees, funding additional maintenance pro projects, as well as current improvement needs, such as the previously mentioned facility condition assessments and seismic assessments, implementing building code upgrade requirements and energy efficiency enhancements, to name only a few. Telework has been largely successful for Caltrans and is expected to remain a component of our work environment. Our management teams diligently assess, are diligently assessing and evaluating the extent to which telework is sustainable for our workforce to successfully deliver projects and meet our strategic objectives. This determination contributes to the requirements for office space within our buildings and is a critical component in planning for building replacements. Currently, none of Caltrans office buildings are in the active process of being replaced. However, when that time arrives, as expected, Caltrans will ensure that all projects tie directly to the respective SHSMP and shop. The planning process for new construction includes a multitude of factors for consideration that go beyond the structural elements and size. Caltrans, in partnership with DGS, uses a variety of sources and analysis tools, such as a smart location con calculator and transit scores, to identify how workplace location affects worker commute, travel, and housing, as well as the surrounding community. Lead and z &E standards will be incorporated in our office building replacement projects. Additionally, SB 1203, which requires 
net zero greenhouse gases by 2035, and SB 1020, requiring 100% renewable energy by 2035, both of which were signed into law in September, will have significant impacts on Caltrans's operations, requiring major operational shifts in our facilities as well as fleet and equipment. Caltrans has committed to participate in DGS's work group focused on policy updates to reflect law changes. Next slide, please. We're pursuing LEED recertification in the District 4 Oakland office, as well as the Sacramento headquarters office. In the area of energy, we are really excited as we are uh, assessing projects at state-owned office buildings to improve energy efficiency, which will be completed through the Energy Savings Program in partnership with Caltrans's Office of Sustainability and the Department of General Services Office of Sustainability. Caltrans has approximately 20 facilities in various stages of energy audits. Four of those project, four of those locations are at, head, at the headquarters and district office facilities. Using 2022 utility data, the estimated annual energy savings is well over a million dollars. This, this does not take into consideration the recent natural gas rate hikes the state is experiencing. Examples of energy savings projects under evaluation and consideration are upgrading lighting systems, installing advanced power strips, reflective window film, replacing boilers and chillers with more efficient models. Additionally, all state office buildings are in the process of being enrolled in the demand response programs to reduce energy during peak electrical consumption periods when called upon by the California Independent System Operators, Cal, Cal, Cal ISO. The goal will be to have all Caltrans office buildings enrolled for the next demand response event in 2023. In greenhouse operations, our offices are moving toward a paperless office, if feasible, as we continue to telework. Many are utilizing digital records and using electronic devices. We're also updating operations for organic waste management at Caltrans in concert or in compliance with SB 1383, which requires organic waste collection services. And then finally, water conservation. Caltrans state-owned buildings have turned off all water at non-functioning for non-functional turf. The office of Caltrans's Office of Sustainability is actively tracking water usage and reporting to DGS and we're assessing additional offices that may qualify for projects and the new DGS water grant program. Next slide, please. With that, I'd like to conclude by thanking you for your time, and I hope you could hear me. Uh, with that, Mike and I are happy to open it up for questions. Thank you, and yes, Eureka, yay, we were able to hear you. Uh, do we have any questions from commissioners? Yes, Commissioner Falcone. Yes, Shannon gets a gold star for knowing how to, to present. Um, uh, thank you so much for the presentation, both of you, Mike um, and Shannon. Just for clarification, my own um, education, on slide nine, where, um, you know, there, I, I had a question about what determines delineation uh, between DGS and Caltrans on um, each of the facilities uh, happy, for maintenance? I'm happy to answer that. Um, typically, it's location. So the locations where, where DGS is not involved, and let me just make sure before I continue, you can still hear me OK? Uh, could you speak slowly? Sorry, please? yes. Thank you. Um, on location where DGS is not involved is primarily at our at remote locations. So um, Eureka, Bishop, San Luis Obispo are not locations where DGS has um, 
established services. They're not uh, located in those areas being remote. So where DGS services are not available, that responsibility falls solely on Caltrans to uh, maintain. At other locations where DGS is involved, they, they could either cover just janitorial or they could cover janitorial and building engineering services, landscaping and other such uh, services. It depends on the availability of um, DGS as to what staffing they can provide in that area, as well as what staffing Caltrans already has in existence. I hope that answers the question. I'm happy to share more if, if there's more question. Thanks, I appreciate that, Shannon. Um, I think there was on that slide where both Caltrans and DGS shares responsibilities. That is correct. And those are District 2, uh, Reading, mm -hmm. Oakland, District 4, Fresno, District 6, District 7, Los Angeles, District 8, Riverside, District 10, Stockton, and then the uh, Sacramento headquarters building. Thank you. It was just for my understanding, and and so, is there some sort of mutual agreement on how you delineate maintenance yeah. responsibilities? And the reason why I ask is is you know just sort of understanding how you know shop funding is um, is shared between um, both agencies. You know how that that you know in general works out. So just to be clear, shop funding is not used at um, a couple. Of, so the, all of the places where shop funding is utilized are locations owned by Caltrans. So in those locations, you would think of, of DGS as being a contractor that meets our needs. We hire them or we pay for their services to, to maintain the building that we own. There are two buildings that currently DGS owns, and that is District 3 Marysville and District 11 San Diego. For the building itself, we have, to my knowledge, we would not and have not pursued shop funding for those two locations when repairs are needed. Okay, thank you, appreciate it. Please pardon my, my rookie questions, but it's just for my understanding. So thank you, Shannon. Fair enough. Um, I, I did have a quick question. So I think it was maybe two years ago, um, we had talked about the maintenance stations and how, you know, yes, the office buildings during COVID people weren't in and some are still not in to the office buildings, but it's really those maintenance stations that uh, needed the assistance and bringing them uh, up to code. And uh, I know I looked at one in the Valley that in, in sad disrepair, I gotta say, and that we have those workers that are out there 24 hours a day and during the floods and all of those things using those facilities. So where are we in, in putting our focus on those facilities? Thank you, Chair Eager. <clears throat> um, I'll cover this a little bit in the in the state highway system management plan briefing, but as I mentioned, uh, we've been making good progress towards the things that we were required to do in SB1. Uh, we've been implementing a number of different asset management strategies that are that are generating efficiencies within the shop, and I'm, I'm happy to report that in this 2023 state highway system management plan. Uh, we are proposing um, a, a significant increase in the investments in our transportation related facilities, specifically targeting maintenance stations statewide. Good news, thank you. Any other questions? Yes, yeah, Dr. Just, Weiss. Just a quick question. Shannon, you mentioned updating the, the facility condition assessments of the office buildings. Is that being done 
in one effort in which there'll be some kind of report that we could look at, or is that a, you know, we're doing one or two a year effort? Thank you for the question. So we are implementing a new contract that will start in fiscal year 23-24, um, and separate reports will come out for each location as they are completed. So uh, no, it will not be one comprehensive report for all locations. I do not believe, and I will get clarity from my staff and, and, and correct that response if, uh, if it is not accurate. My belief is, is that we will have a report for each location and the completion of all of them are, is expected to be within the 23-24 and possibly into the 24-25 fiscal years but we will definitely begin uh, this coming fiscal year. Okay, great. If, if you could just loop us in on the first one that gets finished and you know, I'll have, uh, we'll look at, Tim would be really, he's really, I can, you can't see him now, he's really excited to look at them. And we'll say, once we see the first one, we'll, we'll see if we have any interest in seeing any more. Thank you. I'd be happy to do so, thank you. Was that your excitement face, Tim? Didn't look like that to me. Looked like a little grimace, just saying. Um, any other questions? Okay, we will move on to tab 56. Thank you. Tab 56 is an informational item. Cal California Streets and Highways Code section 164.6 requires Caltrans to publish a 10-year state highway system management plan as part of an overall asset management implementation. In odd number of years, a, a draft plan <clears throat> Uh, is submitted to the commission by February 15th for comment and is required to be submitted to the governor and legislative members by June 1st. Mike Johnson, state statewide asset management engineer, is here again to present an overview of the 2023 State Highway System Management Plan. Uh, thank, <clears throat> thank you again. This one's a solo presentation, so hopefully it'll go quicker. Um, appreciate the opportunity, uh, Madam Chair and Commissioners, to present uh, the 2023 State Highway System Management Plan. Uh, this is a, an overview of the plan. Uh, the plan itself, the draft, will be uh, transmitted to the Commission on or before February 15th as required by regulation. And um, this is really to help seed the review of that and to provide comment in subsequent meetings. Next slide. Um, so this plan is a little bit challenging to create because we're really threading the needle between a number of different regulations. We have uh, United States code in a number of different areas that govern certain required aspects of our asset management work, as well as streets and highway code that Tim mentioned and California government code. And these, these regulations effectively tie our asset management work to the State Highway System Management Plan and that subsequently to the shop. And, and the State Highway System Management Plan in, the, in its role is, a, is probably the single most critical document we do in terms of producing the shop. Next slide. So you've seen this slide before, or many of you may have seen this slide before, and it, it really shows the continuum of the asset management uh, key deliverable documents that we produce. And on the very left is the California Transportation Asset Management Plan. Um, it's pretty high level, four primary assets statewide. Um, the system is broader than just the state highway system that we look at. So we're looking at state and locally owned assets in that plan. But as we take it down a, a level to more of an operational implementation, that's where the state highway system management plan comes in. Here we expand the objectives that we look at out to 33 different objectives, and we do an independent performance analysis for each of our 12 districts. So if you do the math, that's about 400 different performance gap analysis that are performed, uh, whereas the asset management plan itself has four. So it's about 100 times more granular, and it really is the heart that seeds uh, subsequent projects uh, subsequent planning, shop programming, and project delivery. So it is really uh, the seed that all of the projects that come to you in the shop are born from. 
Next slide. Uh, just a little bit about the timeline. This is always very confusing uh, to folks. So we are currently uh, working on the 2021 State Highway System Management Plan. That plan is really governing planning that will become the 2024 shop. So we'll add that in uh, in the last two years of the 2024 shop. What we're talking about today in the 2023 plan uh, will encompass uh, portions of the 2022 and the entire 2024 shop, plus uh, a new set of two years worth of work that will become the 2026 shop. So my point is that we're here in 2023 and we're talking about setting up projects that are gonna be coming out in uh, 2028 through 2030. Okay, so they're quite a bit out in advance that we're working. Next slide. Uh, components of the plan, we have an unconstrained needs assessment. So this is a look at what it takes to achieve the targets that the commission has adopted independent of available funding. Uh, then we have funding projections. So we work very closely with Keith Duncan and the budget team and the Department of Finance to come up with a 10 year projection of revenue to use in the plan. Um, and then from that, we develop a constrained investment plan. Uh, they, <clears throat> the investment, the constrained investment plan uh, for 2023 is approximately half of the total need. Um, and that's, considerably better than it's been in the past, believe it or not. Uh, when I started the first, when we started the first SHSMP, I think we had funding for about 25% of the need. We are now up to 50% of the need. Um, and that's thanks largely to SB1 and now to IIJA. So good news there. Um, we present all of the assets, the inventory, current condition breakdown, and uh, the resulting performance that we expect over the 10 year period from the constrained investment plan. So this is using modeling, deterioration modeling and other techniques to give the best estimate that we can of what things will look like if we invest this way. Um, and then uh, there's a lot of narrative descriptions of these 33 objective areas. So, you know, it's, we're trying to be very transparent about what is an in, is not included in each of these things and how each of these objectives are evaluated. And then finally, the, the appendix, which most people don't look at, but um, this is where all of the technical calculations are done that, that support the needs assessment. So if someone cares to dig into all the numbers, they're all presented in a very transparent way. Next slide. Um, this is just a screenshot of uh, how we present the different objectives. Uh, you know, documenting the inventory, its current condition, and we're at a point now where this is, uh, uh, this will be our fourth plan that we've developed so we can start to develop some trend histories over time, uh, which can be very uh, helpful in our asset management decision making. Next slide. Uh, we use a five-step needs assessment approach. Uh, we start with the existing inventory. We look at current condition, apply deterioration modeling to that, uh, look at what our targets are, evaluate uh, how far we are or project to be with deterioration from those targets, um, and then we price all that out. And that's how we come up with the needs assessment. Next slide. Um, this is how we present our needs assessment. And when you see the plan, you will see this column that says pipeline. The pipeline includes all of the projects that you've already adopted in a shop, plus the projects that uh, Caltrans has committed resources to developing for the next shop through our formal planning work plan. And then what you see as the gap is really the back five years of the plan that's where we see how much is still left to be done to get to our goals, targets, and, and then what that will all cost over the 10 year period. Next slide. Uh, in terms of the needs assessment uh, for the 2023 plan, we see uh, overall needs slightly lower than they were two years ago. Um, that is really a net effect of a number of different changes that were incorporated into this plan. Um, you know, certainly we made a lot of changes to incorporate CAPTI policies into uh, the State Highway System Management Plan and, and therefore the shop. 
Um, and that affects a number of areas, safety, uh, climate, uh, zero emission transportation mode, bike and ped. Um, and then there have been some legislative and regulatory changes related to uh, a new stormwater permit that is uh, causing our costs to go up uh, because we have to address stormwater on smaller uh, disturbances than we used to. And then uh, there was a law that was signed into effect a few months ago pertaining to wildlife connectivity within transportation uh, that will have the effect of uh, potentially increasing costs in some locations in the state. But at the same time, we're improving our asset management work. We're getting better and more efficient. Um, and I think we're making better use of the shop dollars. And you know, we're squeezing everything we can out of the funding that we have. Um, and then finally, there were some condition target changes that the, uh, the commission approved uh, since our last plan, and that's also been updated and reflected uh, in this plan. So the net of all of that is uh, slightly less overall needs. Next slide. Uh, since our last plan, we did a lot of work in the area of climate resiliency and um, you just want to point point out that we are adding coastal cliff retreat as a uh, vulnerability into this plan and we've uh, assessed that we've quantified it we've located it and we've priced it all out within the plan that had the effect of adding to the need um, but at the same time we did a much um, further vetting of the bridge sea level rise needs since the last plan, and that had the effect of actually reducing the need. So the net of those two things is that overall our climate resiliency needs still have gone up, but uh, they were offset quite a bit by getting a little more refined on the bridge uh, sea level rise work. Next slide. Uh, wildfire adaptation is another climate uh, resiliency item that we looked at quite a bit. Um, within Caltrans, we have uh, we have stood up a program in the Division of Maintenance that focuses on wildfire mitigation and specifically vegetation control. In addition, we're working with our design units to change design policies uh, to incorporate more fire resistant material selections uh, and designs. And then finally, in terms of the shop, our role primarily with wildfire comes in the form of major damage uh, in addressing burn scar areas to prevent subsequent slides and debris flows. Uh, next slide. Uh, I think Tony, uh, Tony Dang mentioned that uh, between the 2021 plan and this plan, all of the Caltrans active transportation plans have been completed. Uh, those have all been incorporated. In addition, we have a growing history of project work here so we can uh, better evaluate unit costs and actually the mix of work between bicycle and pedestrian work. Um, and that's allowing us to, to come up with better estimates. Uh, we also undertook a very rigorous analysis of bridge overcrossings and undercrossings of the state highway system uh, to uh, more uh, review in more detail the complete streets needs on those assets because those involve widening bridges or lengthening bridges, which are very expensive relative to at-grade complete streets improvements. Next slide. We made some changes in our operational improvement areas to switch from a daily vehicle hour delay metrics to daily person hour delay metric. Um, and this sounds kind of technical and, and kind of down in the weeds, but the importance of doing this is to recognize uh, and, and to allow to better compete, manage lanes, transit priority, and higher modes of transportation. Um, and so we think this is actually going to really improve the overall shop and the state highway system management plan. In addition, we're incorporating growth projections for the first time in delay, uh, which we have not been able to do up until this plan. And that um, that also helps us get a better understanding of what we're looking at in the coming 10 years. Next slide. And this, um, I, this was my surprise for Commissioner Norton, and she's not here to see it, but we are pleased uh, to introduce the concept of mobility hubs into the State Highway System Management Plan for 2023. Our, our traffic operations group within Caltrans has done some incredible work with a consultant uh, assessing uh, park and ride facilities statewide 
and looking for opportunities to uh, rebrand and convert these to mobility hubs. And one of the uh, locations that we're particularly excited about is in Los Angeles at, uh, at Hawthorne. And uh, we see some particularly uh, amazing opportunities to connect to the Metro line as well as micro mobility. And um, I, I was going to make a, make a joke, but half serious that we, you know, I'd like to work to make that be the Hillary Norton mobility hub because uh, she was a huge advocate of this and, and really helped. Well, I live in Hawthorne. Oh, okay. Well, then the Lou Norton Mobility Hub, well, we'll, we'll have that, that has a ring to it. You like that. Where exactly in Hawthorne? Uh, it, you know, I knew you were going to ask that. It's uh, it's right off the metro line. And, uh, the, green, the green line? Pardon me? Off the green line? Yes, right off the green line. Uh, very close to a lot of uh, trip destinations there for micromobility. Okay. You, you know that the Century Freeway took out the Beach Boys home in Hawth the city of Hawthorne, right? So you want to call it the Beach Never Boys Never going to give Caltrans for that. <laughs> anyway, very excited about this. We're, get, we're, we're looking to try to pilot some of these locations in this plan. And um, part of that piloting is include, includes the assessment of pre- and post project conversion to see how many people can we lure out of um, you know out of their single occupancy vehicle into these facilities next slide sure. very quickly oh. on your mobility hubs how is that going to be connecting as well though to um, the connecting communities the um, mobility hubs and, and we could probably do a whole presentation on this but when we're assessing these locations the majority of the priority is attributed to the ability to connect to other modes of transportation. And so it, it is a primary component. I think it's about 40% of the overall prioritization is the ability to connect to other modes. And in the case of the Hawthorne facility I just mentioned, uh, it's proximity to the Metro line as well as white, uh, walkable, bikeable, micromobility accessible uh, businesses is is really critical and it's a reason why that why that particular location is really floated up for us in Caltrans or in in California next slide please um, so in terms of the investment plan uh, we will continue our fix it first I, I want to state that very loud and clear and that was you know a overarching uh, criteria in the framework for CAPTI. But as I mentioned, we're getting more efficient in how we do this. And um, there, are, there are things where we're, we're realizing efficiencies through our asset management, and that's allowing us to then redirect some of those savings into other areas. And some of the areas that we anticipate uh, increasing our investments uh, will include climate resiliency projects. Uh, so we have um, uh, proposals to increase our investment there, as well as bicycle and pedestrian investments from our 2021 plan. We're able to do all of that because of these efficiencies and still achieve uh, the SB1 targets that we're committed to. So I think here we're starting to see the value of asset management because we're, we're getting more done with the same money. Um, and, and again, like I said, we're looking to um, <laughs> for opportunities to fund pilots for the mobility hub, the, the Lou Norton Mo mobility hub or Norton Lou. I, I don't know if we want ladies first, but um, we, we will be proposing that in our draft plan. Next slide. And so as far as opportunities uh, for input in the draft plan, uh, we anticipate releasing it to all the MPOs, uh, RTPAs, and NGOs here in the next couple of weeks. And uh, we'll be seeking public comment. And at the same time, we'll be submitting it to the commission uh, by February 15th to submit, uh, to request comments from the commission. All of those comments will come back in uh, and then we'll update the plan. And the, the plan is due by regulation to the governor and legislative members by June 1st of this year. And that concludes my presentation. Great, thank you. Do you have any questions from commissioners? Yes, Commissioner Norton. I am so sorry that I 
missed it. I feel like I get the Christine Lottie Award for um, being in the bathroom when the really good stuff happens. Um, but I, I just want you to know that it means a lot to have these interoperability networks and to have the highway network seen as something that is a facilitator of different modes. And so I love that you are leaning in on mobility hubs because really as we're building out a transit system, it helps us to connect more and more with these opportunities. And as we're looking at additional express lanes and others, being able to run efficient transit and have people get to and from that transit on our highways is so exciting. So I really wanna resonate with that. And I wanted to find out, as we were talking about um, metrics, how do we start thinking about the metrics of gaining more transit riders or making sure people could bike and walk to different areas along our highway networks? How are we keeping some of that so that we can talk about how we're actually re improving the air quality by encouraging a multimodal use of our highway network? Um, yeah, great question. Like all of them yesterday. Um, <laughs> so, uh, you know, first and foremost, I, I just want to thank you, particularly uh, Commissioner Norton, for really planting the seed for this. And uh, you know, I, I'm happy to be here to show that we we do in fact listen and take that back and have been working to do this. And, and the work that's been done is incredible. Uh, it really is. Uh, but to answer your question, we've talked internally about that and how we might do that. And one metric that we're looking at is the utilization of the facility itself. So our, our consultants have assessed what, you know, how many, how many people are parking in these facilities currently. Once we make these connections, and, and part of this is improving security improving the amenities of these facilities to include electric vehicle charging and other things to make them more desirable, then we ought to see an increase in the utilization of the facilities. And that's how we can get to that metric of how many vehicles did we lure off the road. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Great answer. Any other questions? Yes. Director Weiss. I, I just have a comment. You know, we we, we had a pr presentation on, on innovations yesterday. We had the Pavement Award today for doing something new and really recognize the work Mike and the department have been doing in this area for more than half a dozen years. But it, it is such a significant change for those of us who have been around a long time to really to do to be making decisions based on data. And it's so important. And when you look at the work you're doing here and combine it, with some of the other things you're, you're, you're starting on in the equity area and in prioritizing other on-system you know, investments. Uh, I, I think it, it, it's a tremendous change. And Mike talked about some of the benefits that we're, we're reaping from that. So I just want to acknowledge that and say thank you. Thank you, Mitch. And, and I will have to acknowledge my very wonderful team and all of the asset management folks working in all 12 of our districts, many of them are here today. We acknowledge them too. Thank you so much. Did we have any public comment on 55 or 56? I see no public comment at this time. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Then we're going to take a quick little break here. We will be back at 1130. And during the break, uh, especially if you're as cold as we are up here, feel free to come take a racing shirt. And put and it on. I know what you're wondering. Can I take two? Yes, you can. <laughs> sure. How long was take the break? Take wonderful Valentine's gifts. How long was the break? We'll be back at 1130. Thank you. We're 
That's right. Hey, Bridget. No. Bridget. Um, that I'm here, Justin. Yes, we're looking to test audio again. Yeah, I I mean, it seems that you guys can hear me when you're testing. It just it doesn't sort of translate to the commission. Yeah, there's issues when the meeting is happening that we have to get various mics dialed in, so there's not too much interference. I've told Mitch. I've told Mitch that I've discussed uh, the two issues I've got questions on with Tim. But Tim's saying he can hear me, so that works then. Okay, as long as I can be heard. I'm gonna mute now. Commissioner, if you don't mind, we're going to continue testing. Okay. Uh, testing one, two, three. Yeah, if you don't mind continuing. Testing one, two, three. Testing one, two, three. Testing one, two, three. Here's Bridget. Sorry, I'm back. We're currently working on getting the speaker dialed in that allows the commissioners to hear you. Stand by. Thank you. Okay, we're going to test one more time. If you don't mind, with test one, two, one, two, three. Uh, testing one, two, three. Testing one, two, three. Bridget, you want to give it a try? Sure. Testing one, two, three. 
Testing, one, two, three. <clears throat> Thank <laughs> you. 
Bridget, are you still available for another test? Um, I can test Justin, although um, I just confirmed with Laura, she'll present my final <coughs> item. Okay, I, I think I still just want to do the test to see if we can get this speaker dialed in. Yeah, that yeah. makes sense. Um, okay, testing one, two, three. Testing one, two, three. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, continue one more time. Testing one, two, three. Testing one, two, three. Okay, thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Bridget. Okay, okay. Thank you, Bridget. Thank you, Bridget. Can no you hear problem. me? No problem. Thank you. I can, yeah. <laughs> okay, thank you. Okay, test. One, two, three. Test. One, two, three. Test. One, two, three. Test. One, two, three. Test one, two, three. Test testing one, two, three. Testing one, two, three. Seven. Testing one, two, three. Testing one, two, three. Testing one, two, three. Can you hear us now? Testing. Testing one, two, three. Testing. 
testing one, two, three. Uh, Bridget, if you don't mind testing your audio one more time. Sure. Testing one, two, three. Testing one, two, three. One more time. Testing one, two, three. Testing one, two, three. Three. We're going to have to kill that if it's that's the problem. 
uh, their speaker. But I think he already rewired it. If it's just this microphone, we can also kill this microphone. Huh? Test, one, two, three. Test, one, two, three. Test, one, two, three. We're almost there. Sounds pretty good over here. You have sound, Doug, out of that speaker? Doug. Doug. Do you have sound out of that speaker? Okay. All right. <clears throat> I'll tell you the project. Check. Check. 
Check. Test one. Check. Madam Chair, Commissioners, and um, Executive Director Weiss uh, for giving us the opportunity to talk about our final um, interregional transportation strategic plan addendum, or the ITSP addendum. Um, I did want to acknowledge a couple of key people from my team, uh, mainly Kathleen Hanley, um, who's been leading this effort, um, along with her system planning team. Um, they've done a great job leading this work, um, as well as other supporting divisions and districts. Um, and also I wanna acknowledge the partnership with the commission staff. Uh, they've been great to work with. And also we, we wanna thank um, our state, regional and local partners uh, for participating in the process. It was truly a team effort. Uh, next slide. That's okay. All right. Uh, so the 2022 ITSP addendum builds on the 2021 ITSP by highlighting each corridor's multimodal and multidisciplinary needs and providing more detail information on the in-regional needs. The addendum was developed in response to a requirement in the 2022 STIP guidelines uh, for an assessment of interregional corridor needs. While the addendum does not uh, does designate any new priority and regional facilities, such as uh, highways or rail facilities, it does carry over the corridor de designations from the 2021 ITSP. The document is broken into three chapters. Um, the introduction lays out the purpose of the addendum and its relationship to the 2021 ITSP, the ITIP, as well as the corridor planning process. The second chapter provides a high level needs assessment of each of the 11 uh, strategic and regional corridors. Each corridor has uh, brief text sections um, and accompanying visuals uh, describing needs identified by Caltrans, other state agencies, regions, local partners, as well as advocacy and community members. The final chapter focuses on implementation 
including how Caltrans will expand this assessment to all state highways required in the 2022 uh, STIP guidelines. And this addendum uh, serves as a uh, annual update on the progress that we're making on the STIP guidelines. And uh, moving forward, Caltrans will update uh, CTC each December, uh, starting 2023, on the progress that we're making uh, assessing the state routes uh, per this 2022 STIP guidelines. Next slide. So the ITSP addendum was developed collaboratively with state, regional, and local partners. Uh, the process began with stakeholders meeting uh, for, for each of the 11 corridors, and the meetings included staff from Caltrans, CTC, regional and local agencies, tribal nations, and community groups. The needs for each corridor reflect the input from these meetings. Caltrans staff have met monthly uh, with CTC planning staff to ensure that the addendum is responsive and well aligned with the commission's work. And the draft addendum was posted to uh, Caltrans ITSP website um, August 5th. Um, and, the draft, and, the, and the comments were accepted through September 30th. The comments matrix was posted along with the final ITSP, uh, which was posted to our website. Um, that, as stated earlier. Uh, the comments from the partners uh, were incorporated uh, when they were feasible and a matrix of each of those comments uh, was, was included. The final addendum also, um, oh, the, the notification to the addendum was, was emailed to all the stakeholders. And there's a link at the end of the, uh, at the presentation where you can find that, uh, the, the addendum. Next slide. So I want to highlight the main changes uh, since we brought the, the draft ITSP addendum to the commission in August 2022. Uh, so the needs assessment chapter now includes more highway specific needs, including the SB 671 uh, freight, uh, clean freight corridor analysis, uh, bus and shoulder pilot uh, case studies, as well as managed lane needs and highway safety issues. The, uh, the, the final addendum also expands on how the uh, ITIP projects are prioritized and what role the addendum plays in that process. And a summary of those um, outreach efforts uh, done in part in the development of the addendum was also added to the introduction. Most of the comments received from the stakeholders of the draft addendum were clarifying edits uh, to the needs identified for each strategic and regional corridor and these changes have been made throughout the document. Finally, the steps for the implementation of the addendum uh, will be the focus uh, for the remainder of my presentation. Next slide. All right, uh, so the first step of, of implementation uh, for the addendum uh, is a 2024 ITIP. Uh, Caltrans staff have been working closely with CTC programming staff on the development of the 2024 uh, STIP guidelines to improve transparency and efficiency and improve the process for ITIP programming. For the ITIP, Caltrans Division of Transportation Planning, as well as financial pro programming and rail and mass transportation um, are going to be kicking off a process with the Caltrans districts and our regional and local partners in March. Um, having just completed the nomination process for SB1 and federal programs, we have a list of great projects uh, that we weren't able to move forward in this cycle that we plan to use as a starting point. Uh, but we'll also accept new nominations from our partners uh, through the Caltrans district offices. Uh, for the 2024 ITIP, while projects aren't required to be in a quarter plan, we expect many of the nominations will come from our recently completed Caltrans plans as well as regional plans. And this might include uh, our Caltrans active transportation plans, uh, some of the multimodal quarter plans that have been completed, uh, climate change plans, uh, state modal plans, as well as managed lane system plans. Uh, projects for the 2024 ITIP cycle will be evaluated using the ITIP scoring criteria developed as part of the 2021 IT, um, ITIP, or ITSP, excuse me. Uh, these scoring criteria were vetted with partners and was used uh, to construct the 2022 ITIP. Next slide. All right, um, so the ITSP addendum and the STIP guidelines both indicate that there's further work that needs to be done to identify specific improvements on, in, on their in-regional system that will become future ITIP projects. The graphic on the right uh, illustrates a high-level vision for what this work will represent. Previously, Caltrans maintained uh, 
transportation concert reports for each route uh, in each district. Uh, most of the 386 TCRs that were developed uh, were updated between 20, uh, yeah, 2014 and 2017 and are not aligned with Caltrans climate and equity goals. As Caltrans and our regional partners have developed comprehensive multimodal corridor plans or CMCPs, we have realized that these documents are resource intensive and although that analysis is needed for the programs like SCCP, uh, it disadvantages our local regions um, who have fewer resources to complete these expensive plans. Also on average, most quarter plans take about uh, two years to develop, uh, in some cases three. Uh, given the number of routes and the various levels of complexity with the routes around the state, we cannot have a one-size-fits-all approach, uh, nor do we have the resources or time to develop CMCPs for every single route in the state. Um, as such, we're proposing a new type of quarter plan that's less resource intensive and takes less time to develop while still thoroughly um, including analysis such as multimodal uh, and multidisciplinary needs of the state transportation system. The idea is that most quarters can utilize this nimble uh, quarter plan uh, format while the most heavily congested quarters uh, that are strong candidates for SCCP can use the CMC CMCCP uh, format. Uh, for the remainder of the state highway system routes uh, in remote areas, uh, the planning uh, focus will be identifying maintenance, resilience, and safety needs. We envision that the streamlined planning document will save time, require fewer resources to develop, and will be heavily coordinated uh, with our asset management process. While we believe that this new framework will help Caltrans uh, achieve the STIP guideline requirement of expanded analysis uh, faster than uh, producing the CMCPs for every single quarter in the state. Um, our plan is to kick off the development of the guidelines for these new quarter and route type plans um, in, the, in March, and we're hoping to give the guidelines or finalize the guidelines uh, by the fall. Uh, the guidelines will also include clear and transparent uh, prioritization of routes uh, for uh, Caltrans quarter plan development um, with the goal of producing a multi-year uh, work plan to complete all the routes throughout the state. This entire process will include robust partnership with Caltrans headquarters programs and districts, as well as our uh, regional, local, and state agency and advocacy group partners. Next slide. And I think that concludes my presentation. I'll be happy to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you. And yes, it's wonderful to see you in person. I'm hoping to see more of you in the future. Um, do any of our uh, commissioners have questions or comments? Director Weiss. Can we go back? To, can we go back to the last slide? So, Marlon, I guess when I'm kind of, I'm interested in understanding how you're thinking about this, this effort long term. To me, it seems a little bit like painting one of your really huge bridges. You start at one end and you go to the other and then you go back to the other. The, the first end and you start again because by the time you're finished you need to do that and it seems like this is some is similar like so you know you're going to have to update your corridor plans at a certain frequency and what you know once you've done the, the ones that are already done uh, you know a few years you're gonna have to redo them again and the same with these other plans is that how you guys are envisioning your workload related to this okay um I think it's going to be a combination of that, but as well as other factors. Um, I mean, back in the old days when we had the transportation concept report. <laughs> okay. Um, but back in the old days when we had the transportation concept reports, you know, we, we had a regular update cycle. Um, so it was like three uh, to five years, depending on the complexity and the type of uh, the report that we were uh, presenting. Um, now I think we're in a, in a different age. Um, you know, because we're, we're more data driven. Um, so there might be other factors that we might um, uh, be considering. Um, but, but I want to say the most, the, the most important piece is we want to make sure that we have 100% coverage across the state. And that is our, our first goal, um, you know, because I think it is problematic for us to have these TCRs, you know, that date back to 2014 um, that aren't in alignment. And the reality is that we still need to make decisions 
um, moving forward. Um, and so we really want to make sure that we can develop that work plan. Um, and as part of that work plan development, it's we're going to have a prioritization uh, scheme uh, that's going to ba be based off of many factors, um, you know, depending on uh, the priority of, of different routes, um, you know, looking at uh, different data as far as climate change, um, looking at active transportation needs. So, so we want to make sure that we're factoring all those points. Um, equity, um, looking at disadvantaged communities. Um, so, so that's going to drive our decision making. And then, then moving forward, you know, I think it would make sense to have uh, some sort of process in place for our districts to know when they need to update uh, those plans. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Can you hear me okay? Thank you, Chair Eager. <clears throat> I do have a number to go through. I'm going to try and combine a couple of them. Um, and if, if I go to a little fast or if you have any questions, please feel, to, feel free to stop me. Commissioners, I would press, I'll be presenting items 59 and 60 with a recommendation at the end. Tab 59 is an action item for a roadway rehabilitation project on State Route 70 in Plumas County, requesting an initial allocation of construction support that exceeds the program amount by more than 20%. Caltrans is also requesting allocation of construction capital that exceeds the program amount. The construction support is programmed for 6.81 million and is requesting 9.08 million. Construction capital is programmed for 90.81 million and is requesting for 99.04 million. Construction capital and support estimates are greater than the program amount due to an increase in quantities and unit price for earthwork and hot mix asphalt and then the number of working days that are needed <clears throat> for the project. Construction capital increases are related to a late design change to move from a reinforced embankment to a retaining wall, which led to changes in the design and quantities of several items. And while these changes were previously accounted for, there were increases in the final quantities and additional increases to the estimated unit prices, which accounts for the majority of the increase to the engineer's estimate. Construction support is increased due to the need to increase the working days from 240 to 360 days. Tab 60 is an action item for a drainage system restoration project, including a fish passage project at Solstice Creek on State Route 1 in Los Angeles and Ventura counties, requesting an initial allocation of construction support and construction capital that exceeds the programmed amount by more than 20%. The construction support is programmed for 5 million and is requesting 6.85 million, and the construction capital is programmed for 20.9 million and is requesting 28 0.006 million. The construction capital estimate is greater than the programmed amount due to the modification of the stream bed fish passage design for Sol the Solstice Creek Bridge. Also, there was a relocation of a county water line dispo and increases due to disposal of contaminated soils and groundwater. Also, increases to, to trenchless installation of, for two culverts. The construction support estimate is greater than the programmed amount due to the need to add an additional 30 working days to the project and additional 750 days for plan establishment and also for additional resources for environmental monitors and reporting that were higher than anticipated. Are there any questions on tab 59 and six or 60?
Thank you for the question. Uh, uh, I'll just project. Gloria Roberts, District 7, Acting Director, Chair Eager, Commissioners, thank you. Director Weiss, um, if we would have programmed it the same way, um, initially it was programmed at 17 culverts um, because we that was in 2016. So it was prior to us having SB1 and shifting to asset management in the way of how we really review and inventory our assets, inventory our assets. So when we did the deeper analysis and went out and did culvert inspections, we found that there were actually less culverts that we actually needed to rehab. Um, some we did rehab as a result of an emergency contract that we put out in response to the 2018 Woolsey fires. So there were some culverts that were damaged and so we reduced the numbers because we fixed a few of those with, with that emergency contract. And then a few more, we did deeper hydrolysis, um, hydraulics analysis and felt that we didn't need to actually do any rehab on those. So that's how we ended up with the 13. And so in reviewing the 13, we also picked up, given the opportunity that Solstice Creek is identified as part of our fish passage program, to do remediation, we wanted to take that opportunity and do that. So in hindsight, we probably would have just had less to begin with in terms of programming the numbers. Um, it would have been just the 13. Fish passages, it's basically aquatic, you know, wildlife connectivity. So you're really looking at, you know, the, the habitat of successful um, establishment of an environment. So that includes a lot of coordination with our permitting agencies. And being on the coast, we have the additional layer of the coastal development um, considerations. And so while um, I don't know the cost of fish passages, in other areas, it is um, does take more time and consideration, and the monitoring as we're going through the construction also adds to the cost. But there's definitely considerations that we've had to make um, in the bridge design to accommodate for the fish passage, um, as as was indicated in our book item, with just making sure that it, the environment um, that is being built for the fish is actually going to be successful in. in, in and it entails a lot of requirements that we need to meet with through the California Department of Fish and Wildlife.
So for tabs, oh, you're waiting for public comment. So staff has reviewed the project and the request for both 59 and 60 and recommend approval. Motion to approve. Aye. Commissioners, item 61 is an action item for a roadway rehabilitation project on US 101 in Santa Barbara County, requesting a supplemental allocation for pre-construction support for the plan specification and estimates phase in the amount of 585,000. While it was, it was originally part of a roadway rehabilitation project, this is actually a split project from the Santa Barbara South Coast US 101, or one of the segments from the Santa Barbara South Coast US 101 HOV pavement rehab projects to consider fish passage. Per conditions of the Fish and Wildlife Permit for the overall project, Caltrans and the Santa Barbara COG, CAG, sorry, um, we're required to do a fish passage feasibility study at Toro Creek. The initial funding was um, co-funded with, with Santa Barbara CAG. To do the feasibility study, this request is to actually complete the design package for the construction of the fish passage element under Toro Creek Bridge to meet permit conditions. The department will be fully funding the remaining phases of this project by the June 2023 CTC meeting and is currently updating the cooperative agreement for cost sharing with Santa Barbara County Association of Governments. Staff has reviewed the project and the request and recommends approval of this item. Move to approve. Bradshaw. Commissioners, I will be presenting items 62 through 69 with a recommendation at the end. So that's a lot of items, so please feel free to ask any questions along the way. Item 62 is an action item for a drainage system restoration project on State Route 18 in San Bernardino County, requesting $1.205 million in supplemental funds to re-advertise the project. In August of 22, the department opened a single bid for the project, and the bid was 181% over the engineer's estimate. Due to the high bid and low competition, the department decided to reject the bid and re-advertise the project while also making some changes to, in to attract more bidders. Traffic control items were also modified to increase safety by the addition of traffic monitoring and warning of a traffic monitoring and warning system. Uh, Caltrans recertified the, the engineer's estimate in November 22 to better align with current unit prices. Item 63 is an action item for a collision severity reduction project on various routes and interstates in Alameda and Contra Costa County, County that is requesting $2.52 million in supplemental funds to award the contract. In November 22, Caltrans opened four bids, of which the lowest bid is above the engineer's estimate. The cost increases on this project are largely attributed to spike in material costs, inflation, and shortage of skilled labor. In addition, higher fuel prices significantly increase the cost to transport both material and labor to each of the 29 work locations across the two counties. Item 64 is an action item for a pavement rehabilitation project on State Route 14 in Los Angeles County, requesting $44.165 million in supplemental funds to, to award the contract. In March of 22, the department advertised the contract and held opening in November of 2022. The delay to the bid opening was due to the department receiving numerous bidder inquiries and addressing them by issuing nine addendums with revised contract plans. The contract received seven bids, of which the lowest bid was over the engineer's estimate. The cost increases on the project are related to changes in the contract after allocation and significant cost increases in unit prices to, of construction materials, labor, fuel, and other items. This project was also selected to be a pilot project for utilizing new specifications for renewable diesel requirements 
which mandates the use of 95% renewable diesel for in-use off-road diesel, diesel fueled vehicles and equipment. This impacted the bid prices for roadway excavation, concrete pavement removal, aggregate base, and other items that require the use of heavy equipment. Item 65 is an action item for a bridge rail replacement and upgrade project on US 101 in San Mateo County requesting 1.524 million in supplemental funds to award the contract. In November, Caltrans opened six bids. However, the lowest bid was found to be non-responsive and the second lowest bid is over the engineer's estimate. The cost increases are largely attributed to the current market conditions with inflation and material costs. Item 66 is an action item for a road roadside safety improvement project on US 101 in Los Angeles County, requesting 650,000 of supplemental funds to award the contract. In September of 22, Caltrans opened five bids. First and second low bidders were found to be non-responsive, and the, the third lowest bidder is over the engineer's estimate. Cost increases are largely attributed to the supply chain demand supply chain demand and increased labor costs, which has been generating higher bids, shortage of workers in the labor market and the vol volatility in, of the fuel prices. Item 67 is an action item for a bridge replacement project on I-40 in San Bernardino County. They are requesting 2.905 million in supplemental funds to award the contract. In October of 22, Caltrans opened three bids of which the lowest bidder was over the engineer's estimate. The cost increases on this project are largely, largely attributed to spike in oil prices and higher transportation costs for ready mix concrete. The project is, is located approximately 100 miles from the nearest commercial supplier of concrete and asphalt. Item 68 is an action item for a transportation management systems project on I-5, State Route 4, and 99 in San Joaquin County requesting 2.69 million of supplemental funds to award the contract. In November of 22, Caltrans opened three bids, of which the lowest bid is above the engineer's estimate, and cost in increases are largely attributed to the market conditions related to fiber optic material shortage. Current demand in fiber optic material has significantly increased over the last months. The bidders also cited the need to implement traffic control systems multiple times at each location to perform activities. And tab 69 is an action item for a roadside safety improvement project on I-8 and State Route 11, 111 in Imperial County, requesting 1.783 of supplemental funds to award the contract. In October of 22, Caltrans opened five bids. However, the lowest bid was found to be non-responsive and the second lowest bid was over the engineer's estimate. The cost increases are largely attributed to suppliers' prices, increase in fuel and oil, and the, the contractors also cited many shifts that are needed to set up temporary barrier and traffic control items. Are there any questions on items 62 through 69? Yeah, I have. Yes, thank you. I think I have uh, Commissioner Davis. Yes, that uh, has a question on 64. On 64, thank you, Chair Eager. Um, I won't say that it's all of us at the commission that are asking, but this is you know, for myself. Um, when we allocate money, um, I think we have a reasonable expectation that in fairly short order, a project's going to be advertised and then a project's going to receive the bids, the bids are going to be opened and work is going to start. Um, it seems unreasonable to me that seven months after the allocation, uh, it's advertised and in another eight months for the bids to be open and uh so first first uh, would appear that at least in my mind caltrans wasn't really ready for this project when we allocated uh first uh secondly um you know why'd they wait so long to uh, and so on that th on that thought why'd they wait so long to advertise and then this bid environment where we've seen prices continuing to increase and increase and increase uh, how much more money are we spending today because uh, the project wasn't ready to be advertised bids opened and work started um i would hope maybe there's some clarification for this on this item caltrans is already up here available to answer your questions
Gloria Roberts again, District 7 Acting Director. Commissioner Davis, thank you for the question. Um, in hindsight, um, for this particular project, um, as demonstrated by the delay in bid opening, um, we did receive over 150 bidder inquiries. And so as we were looking through the questions, um, the bidder increase, we realized there was a lot of work that needed to be done in terms to, um, of changes to the plans and specifications. So in short order, it was not a good quality um, plans and specifications that were put together for this particular project um, that we in hindsight really felt that um, by the time we were, are now able to um, award the contract, if we had put the final package after the nine bidder inquiries is a much um, more succinct and what we would expect in terms of having a good quality um, product. So in this particular fashion, it was just a lot of missteps um, in terms of how we were able to put the final project for advertisement. So that was delay to advertise and then the delay to award. So, so I appreciate your honesty uh, in that answer. Um, would hope that moving forward, uh, obviously I'm sure you're gonna try to do better. And uh, any idea how much more we're paying now because of all these delays? Um, we anticipate there are some, the increases are due to perhaps inflationary factors from the time that we um, advertise a product to when we um, opened it. But a lot of it is just due to um, some of the line items, about 22% of the cost increase are due to pavement line items that were just not captured well in our plans and specifications. And so moving forward, we do concede that we do need to do better in terms of our quality reviews um, with design. And then also working with our construction folks to really look at putting together a buildable and biddable, biddable package. And this is also just to make sure that we are being um, fair to our business partners, our contractors, so that there's not a lot of question and rework. Um, so we really do appreciate their partnerships in terms of asking a lot of questions for this particular project, but we really want to reduce this type of rework and inefficiencies in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Commissioner Falcone? Yeah, this is for item uh, 63. Um, so the dollar <coughs> amounts aren't too alarming, but the percentage increase of almost 82% is a bit concerning. Um, do we know why, Tim, uh, the cost escalation there? I could speculate a little, but I would prefer to ask Caltrans to respond. Thanks. Good afternoon, Commissioner Dina Alponsi, Caltrans District Director in the Bay Area. Um, the reason the amount is really high on this one is we've got 17 routes total, uh, 239 locations. And because of the diverse locations, the, the bid came in much higher than we expected. Uh, there was a lot of traffic control related items that uh, were kind of misestimated during our uh, regular course of design. We thought that each location would, uh, each closure would take care of one location, one shift, one night. But what we found out through the uh, uh, the bits that came in that, that that is not the correct assumptions from the contractor side. And uh, based on that, and based on the uh, the number of other factors also that we cited, such as the gasoline high prices, the market conditions, and also uh, the shortage of labor and inflation. So there was a number of factors that all combined together caused the high uh, percentage that you're seeing in this request. Thank you. Any other questions? All right. Thank you so much. Do we have any public, public comment? comment? Thank you. Staff has reviewed the items 62 through 69 and recommends approval for these items. Lou, 
Second. Do I have a second? Bradshaw seconds. All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Still up, Tim. Yep, I'm, I got three more, and I'm going to be very succinct on these. I'm, I'm going to cover uh, items 70 through 72 with a recommendation at the end. Okay. Item 70 is an action item for a major damage permanent restoration project on State Route 70 in Plumas County, requesting $7.758 million in supplemental funds from construction capital to complete construction. These increases are mainly due to differing site conditions as it relates to soil conditions out in the field. Item 71 is an action item for a major damage project at the Posey and Webster Tubes on State Route 260 in Alameda County, requesting 750,000. Excuse me, Tim. Tim uh, with, a, with apologies, I, I need to recuse myself from item 71 as uh, I was um, an executive at the company uh, that would be the partner on that project, and I still own, though I'm not there anymore, I still own stock. So I uh, can we separate 71 from 70 and 72? How about if I continue to go through, we'll take a vote on, or uh, actually we'll we can separate it. Out, we'll yeah. do 70 I, and 72. I have to, I have to step back. out now. I have to leave. Yeah, yeah we'll do 70, we'll do 72. Two next, yeah. yes. So Instead skip, of 70. And then we'll skip come 71, back. just do 72. Thank, Thank you. you, Tim. Yeah, my apologies, I was trying to cruise through here. All right, 72, so we'll take 70 and 72 together. So item 72 is an action item for a safety improvement project on I-215 in Riverside County, requesting 804,000 in supplemental funds and construction support to complete construction. The construction realized increases due to uh, differing site conditions in the, in the topography as a result of an error in survey information. Um, after reviewing the changes with the contractor, it was determined that project working days would have to increase by 70 days. These additional working days contribute to the majority of the construction support increase. Are there any questions on items 70 and 72? Do we have any public comment? So staff has reviewed the items on 70 and 72 and approve and recommend approval for these items. Motion to approve, Bradshaw. Second, Grisby. Martinez, second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. We'll go back to 71. Okay, item 71 is an action item for a major damage project at the Posey Webster Tubes on State Route 260 in Alameda County, requesting 750,000 in supplemental funds and construction support and 3.15 million in construction capital complete construction. It was identified during after allocation that, and, and during the most recent biennial mandated F Federal Highway Administration inspection reporting that the existing uninterrupted power <laughs> sources are non-operational. This supplemental funds for construction capital and support will be used to replace the uninterrupted power sources along with monitoring panels and other supporting systems. Staff has reviewed the project and the request and recommends approval for this item. Any questions on 71? Any public comment? I entertain a motion. Motion to approve. Bradshaw seconds. Frisbee second. Frisbee second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. We need to bring Vice Chair Gardino back from wherever he went. Is that him? There he is. Good afternoon. Magically appeared. Yes. <laughs> um, I will be taking items 73 and 74 together. Item, item 75 was withdrawn and it's reflected on the change list. So, tab 73 is an action item for the Transit and Inner City Rail Capital Program. The supplementary request of $117,000 is for the construction phase of a multi-level parking structure component of the Dublin Pleasanton Capacity Improvement and Congestion Reduction Program located in Alameda County. The supplemental funds are needed due to cost increases related to construction materials, higher labor costs, and higher fuel prices. The cost increases are lingering effects of the COVID-19 pandemic. The supplemental allocation will allow the completion of the project. Tab 74 is an action item for the Transit and Inner City Rail Capital Program. The supplement request of 300000 is for the right-of-way phase of the Elk Grove Station component of the Valley Rail Project located in Sacramento County. The supplemental funds are needed to complete the engineering support services for utility relocation under the right-of-way phase instead of the construction phase. 
The funds were originally programmed in the construction phase of the project. Staff, had re staff has reviewed these requests and recommends your approval for tabs 73 and 74. Thank you, do you have any questions? Public comment? I'll entertain a motion. So moved. Falcone moves. Brings me second. Two seconds, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. John, 76. Yes, hi, commissioners. 76 is an action item to approve amendments to the 2022 shop. These shop amendments will add 10 new projects to the 2022 shop, and it will revise 10 projects that are currently programmed in the 2022 shop. Of the 10 new projects, seven are major damage, one is safety, and two I want to highlight in particular are new bridge projects that we're able to program in because of additional capacity from IIJA. And I just want you guys to know what they are because they're big and they're significant. One of the two new bridge projects is a $706 million bridge rehabilitation project on the Vincent Thomas Bridge in LA County. It'll rehab the bridge deck, which is currently in poor condition. And the second of the two new bridge projects is a $124 million project to install a suicide barrier on the San Diego Coronado Bay Bridge. So both very good projects that we're able to amend in. Um, and the 10 revised projects are making typical proactive changes in the shop, which we encourage. Staff has reviewed all of these amendments and they're consistent with the shop guidelines and we recommend approval. Thank you. Any questions on 76? Mr. Liu. I've got a question on the uh, Vincent Thomas Bridge item, $700 million to repave or rehabilitate that bridge. Um, the damage done to that bridge is done by heavy duty trucks that are servicing the ports of Long Beach and Los Angeles. And $700 million is an awful lot of money. My understanding is that there will used to be a toll on that bridge, but there no longer is. And I'm kind of wondering why the people who are doing the damage to the bridge aren't helping offset the costs. That is a fantastic question, and I would love it if Caltrans could help us out with that question. Ah, that's not even a good question. That's a fantastic <laughs> question. You win. I'll, I'll take that question. Uh, so first of all, uh, I think it's important to note, it, as Mr. Priority did, that the opportunity to fund this bridge really comes from that tremendous investment from the from the bipartisan infrastructure law. So really, that law was put into place to increase the investment for states, including California, to really be able to tackle these kinds of big infrastructure jobs. Yeah. Yes. Right. Understood. Um, I just wanted to make that point first. Second is um, uh, in California, uh, commercial trucks are already charged a weight fee that is used to fund uh, uh, um, primarily the damage that they cause to our, our structure. It's in California, the way that that's done is that funding currently is used to pay back um, the debt service on transportation bonds, which allows uh, other transportation funds to be used for something like this. Um, so in terms of tolling, um, we do not uh, consider this to be a good opportunity to uh, toll these facilities. Uh, in particular, the state uh, has never uh, instituted a toll for the general uh, maintenance or upkeep of a bridge. Specifically, we did so uh, as uh, 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 chair, or sorry, uh, deputy chief executive officer Weiss already knows, and others may not. We did have uh, a, a toll implemented as part of the seismic retrofit program, but that was a very special case where um, we had a uh, huge cost across the state to tackle a time sensitive problem. In this case, we have the funding that's available and we're ready to move on this project. Um, so as we heard from Mike Johnson, we're only funding 50% of our state highway needs. So I would argue that if we have a $700 million bridge rehab, which I mean, just between us, no one's going to be shocked if that's a billion dollars by the time it's done. And so if that's not an opportunity to consider tolling, what is the opportunity? What's, what is the department's vision as an owner operator of the system? Because to me, that we, that's why we originally put some of these tolls in place is to build the bridges. Well, a billion dollars seems like a good reason to have a toll. 
again, it's it's more about the policy issue here. Do we collectively want to consider instituting a toll to pay for the routine reconstruction of an existing facility versus using our existing funds to meet our stewardship goals for the state? And I would argue that if it cost a billion dollars to do a, a specific facility, we should be considering it. The, does the department have a position on that, Mike? What on the state system do you plan to toll? What on the state system do you plan to toll, if anything? So I, I think we need to have a broader discussion about this because I think there's a there's some policy questions here that we're not going to yeah. get at right now. Yeah. Sure, and I, I understand that. We'll continue the discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have any other questions? Chair Eager, I just like to Chair Eager, I'd like to just make sure that the Coronado Bridge is brought back brought, in, brought into this discussion also. Thank you. Do we have any public comment? And I will entertain a motion to accept 76. Motion to approve. Approve 76. Bradshaw. Second. Second Falcone. All those in favor? Aye. Oh, I'm sorry. All those in favor? Aye. First. Aye. Opposed? No, Martinez. Martinez, opposed? No, no Grisby as well. I'm sorry, what? Grisby was no? No. Okay. Motion carries. 77. 77 is an action item to amend the adopted 2022 shop, but this time to increase the major damage restoration reservation for fiscal year 22 23 by $150 million. This will increase it from the $245 million that it started at up to $395 million. This increase is a result of the many recent winter storms that we've had, as highlighted in Caltrans's report yesterday. And the increase is needed to continue to respond to incidents that happen. Uh, just real quick, Commissioner Falcone, you had asked about um, federal reimbursements, and Caltrans does report the reimbursements to us every year in the closeout report in October. So we see the reimbursements that they get, and this last year it was a lot, it was almost $600 million. Um, so it's, um, it's sometimes we get more than, some years we get more than others. This is a very big year. Um, and in addition that one more thing I'll say is the 395 million that it's being increased to is still below what we've seen previous years close out at. So staff has reviewed this, um, amendment and recommends approval. Thank you, John. Any questions on 77? I'll entertain a motion for approval. Approved. Approved. Second. Horton, all those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Anya. Good afternoon. Tab 78 is an action item to amend the local partnership formulaic program. The eight recommended am amendments will delete one project in Contra Costa County to make the funding available to reprogram add one project in Alameda County, add two projects in Merced County, and add one project in Contra Costa County. Program additional funds to one project in Stanislaw County, and amend one project in Nevada County to deprogram the funds from the right-of-way phase and reprogram them to the construction phase. Staff has reviewed these amendment requests, and they are consistent with the local partnership formulaic program guidelines, and staff recommends your approval. Move approval. Any questions, comments? Any public comment? 
Was it Vice Chair Gardino? Yes, sir. Moved. Do I have a second? Second. Bradshaw. Bradshaw seconds. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. 79. Commissioners, I'll be taking tabs 79 through 81 together. All, of, all three of these items are uh, action items for the Sacramento to Roseville third track phase one project here in Sacramento and Placer counties. Tab 79 is a request to amend the Proposition 1A program by removing 14,367,000 in construction and adding 14,367,000 to the design and right-of-way phases. Tab 80 is a request to amend the Proposition 1B inner city rail program by removing 5,035,000 in construction and adding 5,035,000 to the design and right-of-way phases. Tab 81 is a supplemental request for an additional 24,955,000 in Proposition 1A, Proposition 1B inner city rail and transit and inner city rail capital program funds. The Capital Corridor's Joint Powers Authority previously received a partial allocation to reach 30% design and to begin the right-of-way phase. The supplemental allocation will allow the agency to complete both design and right-of-way. Staff has reviewed these requests and finds them consistent with the, each of the program guidelines. Staff recommends approval of tabs 79 through 81. Any questions or comments from commissioners? I'd just say it's nice to be able to do something for Roseville. Woohoo! <laughs> <laughs> Any public comment? Great. I'll entertain a motion for tab 79 so through 81. Grisby. Grisby made the motion. Lou seconds. All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. 82. Tab 82 is an action item. The Sacramento Regional Transit District requests to retain the proceeds from a sale of two paratransit vehicles purchased with State Transportation Improvement Program's Public Transportation Account Funds. The paratransit vehicles were in service from 2013 to 2018 and have met their useful life requirement of five years. The Sacramento, Sacramento Regional Transit District sold both paratransit, oh, did I just, I was being repetitive, I apologize. Um, so they sold both of the vehicles in January, 2022 uh, for a total of $3,400. Staff recommends that the Sacramento Regional Transit District uh, retain the proceeds from the sale of the paratransit vehicles of 3,400. Staff recommends approval of this request. Thank you, Casey. Questions or comments? Any public comment? To hear a motion? Lou? Sure. Second? Crisby? All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. John, 83 and 84. 83 and 84. So, for 83, we're going to take it in two parts because project number four, we want to consider separately. So first we're going to consider, oh, also on 83, as noted on the change list, project number 11 has been withdrawn. So we're going to consider projects one through three, five through 10, and number 12 first. And 11 has been withdrawn and we'll consider four next. So for these 10 projects, this request will allocate $83,135,000. And for the sake of time, I'll just do one quick uh, local shout out. There's a $9.8 $9 million pavement rehabilitation project in the city of Wheatland that we're making an allocation for. And what's exciting about it was that this project was part of the 2020 Complete Streets Reservation. And that added a class one separated bike path and an enhanced crosswalk visibility to the project scope. So I think it's exciting to see this scope that we added start to become just part of these normal shop projects coming through. And I just wanted to thank the district, Caltrans District 3 team for doing that. And with that, staff recommends approval of all projects on tab 83 with the exception of project number four, which we're gonna consider next, and project number 11, which has been withdrawn. Do we have any questions for John on 83 of the ones he actually uh, presented to us? Any public comment? Commissioner Davis, did you have a question on this one? Uh, on item four. What did he say? Right, so number four, item four. Oh, that we're getting to next. Okay. Yeah. Um, then I'll entertain a motion. Motion to approve, Bradshaw. Second, Norton. All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? 
motion carries. Okay, and part B of tab 83, we're gonna consider project number four, which is a request to allocate $74,431,000 for a 12 mile pavement rehabilitation project on Interstate 880 in Alameda County. This section of freeway contains northbound and southbound express lanes that are operated by the Bay Area Infrastructure Financing Authority, which I will call BAFA for short from here on out. And so these express lanes are operated under a master operations and maintenance agreement, which stipulates that their agency may collect tolls in these lanes and that they're also responsible for the cost of operations, maintenance, and rehabilitation projects in the express lanes. This pavement rehabilitation project proposes to rehabilitate the general purpose lanes as well as the express lanes. And therefore, in accordance with the operations and maintenance agreement, Caltrans has calculated a proportional cost for the express lanes portion that will be BAFA's share of this rehabilitation project. This amount comes to a $7,445,000 contribution from BAFA, which is noted in the book item vote box. Staff would like to highlight a few concerns on this project prior to making our recommendation. This action is important as it could set precedent related to future proportional funding agreements between Caltrans and other express lane operators on the state highway system. CTC staff received the cooperative agreement and supporting information for this project on Tuesday of this week. That very late submittal of the information has not given us adequate time to fully understand the basis of the shared funding of this project. And further, we're a little unclear about how future cost increases would be funded if there are any with bids coming in high or construction cost increases. So with that, uh, I, I did wanna just pause for a second before I make my recommendation and ask if you guys have any questions or comments or would like to have any discussion prior to me making my recommendation. Thank you, I appreciate that. I wanna commend uh, Caltrans District 4, Dean Altuansi, uh, as well as Caltrans uh, headquarters and, uh, and BAFA. Uh, also the Metropolitan Transportation Commission, Therese McMillan. They've worked so well together to find common ground on this very important but very complex uh, proposal. And I, I appreciate deeply um, whenever there's concerns on precedent. So I'll just make it very clear. Uh, in this commissioner's mind, we're not setting precedent with this. And I'll say that on the record. This is a specific project where we are making a decision and it is not to set precedent. Thank you, Vice Chair. I think yeah. Commissioner Davis, you had a question? Yeah, I'm, I'm just a little puzzled if if uh, BAFA is responsible for that lane and just for sake of argument, if it's an $80 million project and that, you know, 20, so let's say that lane's 20% of the lanes, Oh, why are they at 7.4, not 16? Um, that's one question. And the next question is, is in, you know, as, as we have seen consistently since COVID started, um, you know, if the bids come in higher uh, than is anticipated, which is what we probably should anticipate, uh, you know, what sort of formula are they going to use to make sure that BAFA comes up with more money to cover uh, the higher uh, than engineers estimate bid that we probably anticipate. Yes, I, I think Caltrans, I would love to hear how the, uh, the hard work that went into the proportional calculation. Good afternoon again, Dean Alphonse, Caltrans Bay Area District Director. And thank you for the question. It's definitely uh, a very unique circumstances that led to this agreement. Uh, we do have a master agreement with BAFA for all BAFA operated uh, express lanes throughout the Bay Area. This particular agreement, which is related to this uh, uh, project specifically, uh, during the negotiation of the agreement, BAFA raised a very good concern or a very good point that is that although on the master agreement, it talks about BAFA being responsible for operations and maintenance in general, uh, it was actually silent on the, uh, the life cycle for pavements and what that means. So in other words, if they open the express lane yesterday, are they responsible for that full amount versus if they open the express lane a few years down the line of operations? 
We thought this was a very valid uh, point that BEFA brought up. And based on that, we worked out a prorated uh, approach to only the pavement items. So everything is proportional with the exception of the pavement items in this agreement. And that's what mounted to the amount that you saw in the co-op uh, agreement, uh, which has uh, 6,775,000 for construction capital and 670,000 for support. In addition to that, we also had a reserve in there for about 20%, which comes to about 1,355,000. Uh, it is uh, part of the agreement that if there's any additional costs that this project incurs during construction or during bid opening, that uh, BEFA would be responsible for their full share of that. I hope that answers the question. Sure. Can you say that last part again? If there are any additional costs that are incurred when we bid open or during the course of construction, BIFA would be responsible for their full share of that. Proportional to what they're paying now or 20% of? Proportional to the 20%. Chair Eager. Yes, Commissioner Davis. No, I have a question. I, I, I had another question. Yeah. Okay. No, I, I, just, uh, I just wish Sorry, they would have. Davis and I are brothers, so that's I take it as a high compliment. Um, so just quick question: uh, with the co-op agreement coming in so late, like just this week, uh, will BEFA be sharing any of the cost of pre-construction? You know, that's a, design yes. things like that. No, thank you for the question, Commissioner Bradshaw. The pre-construction costs, because of the delayed uh, execution of the agreement, the pre-construction costs fell on us. And this is one of the lessons learned with this agreement. Although we were operating in good faith effort with the understanding that we have the master agreement, we weren't able to execute the project-specific agreement until this week. And we, what motivated us to continue to move forward were two things. One, having the master agreement in place with just the general guidance that we had that they're going to be covering the operations and maintenance costs. But the second uh, motivating factor for us was also the level of deterioration of the pavement on 880. Uh, it, the pavement condition was getting really bad, and with the, uh, pre with the recent trains, it got extravated to the point that we definitely wanted to see this project come to construction during this season and not be delayed another season. But um, you have our commitment that this will not happen in the future as far as executing agreements that late. Not to belabor it, pardon my ignorance on, but there's no alternative to that. No way for BEFA to pay some of the share of the pre-construction because of the timing and when it all came together. Well, the only alternative would be the omission of the scope. Hmm. And, and that we did not see in the best interests of the department, the state or the public. Thank you. Yes, Commissioner Martinez. Question one, which pertains to Commissioner Bradshaw as it pertains to why did it take so long just to read it, but you answered that. But uh, to think back on that, um, if you have, if you do have any more agreements, um, you know, for future projects, uh, I just wanted to make sure. I, I'm a big process person. If you haven't uh, uh, realized that in the question that I asked, process is important, and you have to be consistent with that. So if uh, and, and I agree, we may not be setting a precedence uh, here today, but I think we have to understand that, you know, this body up here is approving of uh, things, and, you know, we're getting agreements very last minute, and I'm sure Caltrans has tons of processes, right, and for whatever reason, this issue, um, and, and, and going through this, uh, based on what you said, based on the circumstances, and, and I thank you for articulating that, but if there are any other future projects, wanting to make sure that we do have a process and that the, and that the, these agreements will uh, be able to, 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 to come to us in a timely fashion and that you'll be able to also um, execute those in a timely fashion. So when they come for us for agreement versus um, at the 11th hour. Certainly, Commissioner Martinez, and, and, and I do agree with you. We, we definitely want to execute these ex uh, agreements early on so we can capture all the costs and make sure that we don't find ourselves in the position where we have to make quick decisions to, to not miss the construction season as, as we as Just very quick, do we have any other similar projects um, like this that are coming down the pipeline? Uh, I am not aware of any in my district. I, I cannot speak to this, the statewide. And I just wanted to make sure that 
just again just going back and making sure that we do have a process that we set. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you, Thank you. Commissioner. Do we have any other questions, comments? Yes, Commissioner Grisby. I just want to associate myself with uh, Vice Chair Gardino's comments earlier. Uh, and appreciate the work of the negotiators. Congratulations. Thank you. I, I just have one last point, if I could. Yes. I'd like to have some kind of commitment out of Caltrans that they'll get these agreements uh, to our folks much quicker to look at so we can have a discussion, a more in-depth discussion about what this is going to do to costs. Um, and uh, I, I, we get a little bit of rain in Northern California, but our construction season is essentially, uh, you know, 10 or 11 months a year, depending on what's going on. So, uh, I mean, we're not Iowa or Minnesota. Um, so I'm not quite sure, uh, you know, how the construction season relates to this issue. I, I apologize. I couldn't really hear. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. So uh, just a, a, a couple of points. Um, I, I, I think, um, as you mentioned, setting a policy and figuring out how we're going to look at this it's statewide is important. I think in doing that, it's important to look at who paid for the lane in the first place and who's controlling the excess revenue. Because if, if we built the facility, someone's charging people to use it and they have control over all the money, then you know maybe we want to make sure that we're, you know, that we care less about the condition of the facility that we hand over to them. Um, the other thing, am I correct? Did you say that future cost increases were gonna pay, be paid 20% by BEFA? Yes, as long as it's not an item related to pavement, but most of the construction items that are coming up are just general construction concerns. So the, the risks that are associated with any construction project. And it, it, Kenny, is that? AFA's understanding also? Yes, and... He, Ken, he's, he's right, I'm pointing at him, he's right behind you. Ken, Ken can so, you reaffirm that, please? Uh, yes, well, we, um, we have uh, set aside uh, a 20% contingency on that, and if there are additional costs beyond that, we will return to our board and seek approval for that additional cost. So, so I would suggest, if it's the commission's desire to uh, approve this allocation, we make that as a condition of the allocation. So it's very clear, moving on, it's proportional on any cost increases. Yeah. Yes, I assume so. John, what do you recommend? <laughs> what he said. <laughs> My staff's recommendation would be that we approve this allocation with the stipulation that future cost increases would be shared proportionally between Caltrans and BEFA at the 20% that we heard them discuss. And even if that means updating the cooperative agreement, um, if it goes beyond the what Kenny said that was in there as reserve. That's a long recommendation, but that's the recommendation. Thank Is you. that, uh, thank you, John, appreciate that. And, and none of you go too far away. Um, District 4 Director uh, Eltawanzi and uh, Ken, uh, Ken and Cow, if you could come back to the mic. Is that consistent with what you have spent months working out together? It is, it is, Commissioner Gerson. Yes, um, I know our negotiating teams have worked very closely on that. Um, I would like to mention that, um, you know, there are certain costs that certainly are uh, attributable to the BEFA and the express lanes, but there are also other pieces um, like the ramps and the interchanges that may not be. So I, I would like to clarify that if there are uh, increases on the pavement side related to, you know, the, the lane, those would definitely be shared. Um, but there are certain pieces that are outside of that that would not be attributable to, well, to BEFA. I think Commissioner Liu has a question for you yeah, about that. Are you telling us that, that the people who ride the express lanes don't use the ramps and intersections? Um, I believe that is the negotiation that we had um, come to uh, okay. during the negotiations. We have to keep negotiating with Caltrans over that, but we're going to set the condition, as recommended by staff, for a motion from me, that any of those costs in the future are going to be proportionate in terms of 20%. 
And also, I'm going to tell you that if you come to us next time with an agreement on a Tuesday and expect us to vote for it on a Thursday, you're not getting my vote. Have you any other questions or comments? Was there changes to the agreement that it changed on Tuesday? I don't recall that. No, no, it was just the so, final so wanna, signature uh, happened on Tuesday. I, I, I want to clarify that. This, this agreement has been months in the making. And if there is a misunderstanding by my colleagues that this agreement was only uh, worked out on Tuesday, that is, that is not my understanding. <laughs> So just to be clear, I mean, in a sense, you're both right. There's been a lot of time talking about what we might agree to, but until we have the signed agreement, we don't know exactly what it says. And so we've been part of conversations with these players for months. So uh, I'm troubled by that comment that we didn't know what was in this agreement. Thank you, Vice Chair. I, th I think this goes to the point of let's make sure our processes are in place and that way we have this way in advance and we know exactly what's coming and so then there's no miscommunication. So I do have uh, a motion on the floor, I think. Yes, I have a motion on the floor um, to accept. Do I have a second? Sure. Bradshaw seconds. Com Commissioner Liu. Thank you. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? No. There's a one no. Um, motion carries. It, just to clarify, just a clarification that within the motion, within the motion is the agreement about the proportional. Yes. Yes. That's what John had proposed. Yes. Thank you. Eighty-four. Eighty-four. 84. 84 is an action item for shop pre-construction support allocations. This item will allocate $81,905,000 for 44 shop pre-construction phases for PNED, PSNE, and right-of-way support. And just real quick so you know, 17 million of that is for to start PNED on the Vincent Thomas Bridge, and $14 million is to I said begin PNED work, but I, that might be PS. Fourteen million dollars that is for the Coronado Bay Bridge Suicide Barrier Project. I'm not going to specify <laughs> the phase because <laughs> I think my notes might be wrong. At any rate, those two bridges are part of this allocation, which is exciting to begin work on that. Staff has reviewed this allocation request and recommends approval of this item. Any questions? Move approval. In a second. Do you have any public comment? Thank you. All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. 85. Casey. Commissioners, I'll be taking tabs 85 through 89 together. Please note tab 90 was withdrawn prior to the meeting. Tab 85 requests to allocate $161,275 to one federal Corona Response and Relief Supplemental Appropriations Act of 2021, also known as CRISA. Tab 86 requests to allocate 220,000 to one state administered state transportation improvement project in Plumas County. Please note one project totaling 34,783,000 was withdrawn prior to the meeting. Tab 87 requests to allocate 11,372,000 to one locally administered state transportation improvement program project in Santa Barbara County. Tab 88 requests to allocate 200, excuse me, 828,000 to three locally administered transportation improvement program projects in Lake, Inyo, and Sacramento counties. And tab 89 requests to allocate 1,525,000 to three locally administered state transportation improvement program projects in Lake and Ventura counties. Staff has reviewed these requests and finds them consistent with the program guidelines. Staff recommends approval of approval of tabs 85 through 89. Thank you, Casey. Any questions? Do we have any public comment? I'll entertain, entertain a motion to approve 85 through 89. Martinez, Martinez moves. Bradshaw second. Either way. 
Bradshaw seconds. All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? <laughs> Motion carries. 91. 90 has been withdrawn, correct? 90 was withdrawn, correct. Okay, 91. Tab 91 is an action item requesting 4 million for the railroad grade crossing protection maintenance program for fiscal year 23-24. Public Utilities Code section 1231.1 requires the commission to allocate an annual lump sum request from the Public, public Utilities Commission for their railroad grade crossing maintenance program. Staff has reviewed this request and finds it consistent with statute. Staff recommends your approval. Thank you, any questions? Any public comment? Entertain a motion? So moved. Second. Norton moved. Lou seconds. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. 92 and 93. Good afternoon, commissioners. I will present tabs 92 and 93 together with a vote after tab 93 is presented. 93 is an action item to approve a cycle two solutions for congested corridors program allocation request of $65 million for the locally administered West Valley Connector Bus Rapid Transit Mainline Improvements Project Component in San Bernardino County. When constructed, this project will improve corridor mobility and transit efficiency with an enhanced green state-of-the-art bus rapid transit system along the I-10 corridor in San Bernardino County between the cities of Pomona, Montclair, Ontario, and Rancho Cucamonga. This will include 21 new transit stations, 3.5 miles of dedicated bus lanes, and 18 zero-emission buses. This project will reduce congestion, enhance transit connectivity, reduce greenhouse gas emissions and vehicle miles traveled, and act as a catalyst for additional housing and commercial development near the proposed stations, supporting mixed-use development. Tab 93 is an action item to approve a multi-funded Solutions for Congested Corridors Program, State Transportation Improvement Program, or STEP, and Local Partnership Competitive Program allocation for the state-administered State Route 1, State Park to Bay Porter Auxiliary Lanes project component on the state highway system in Santa Cruz County. This allocation is for $52,837,000 from the Solutions for Congested Corridors Program, $4,929,000 from the STIP, and $14,394,000 from the Local Partnership Competitive Program a total allocation of $72,160,000. This is the second allocation request for the Greater Watsonville Santa Cruz Multimodal Corridor Program Project, which is programmed for a total of $92,807,000 in cycle two of the Solutions for Congested Corridors Program. The Bay Porter Auxiliary Lanes Project will provide several highway, transit bus, active transportation, local road and emergency project benefits in unincorporated Santa Cruz County and the city of Capitola. As the implementing agency, Caltrans will construct three miles of hybrid bus on shoulder auxiliary lanes and 2.9 miles of active transportation facilities and other improvements, which will include a bicycle and pedestrian overcrossing with sidewalk and four Americans with Disabilities Act or ADA ramps. This component will contribute to the overall solutions for congested corridor cycle two project, which will increase multimodal options, reduce vehicle miles traveled, reduce congestion and reduce greenhouse gas emissions overall. These requests are consistent with the Solutions for Congested Corridors program and guidelines, the STIP and guidelines, and the Local Partnership Competitive Program and guidelines. Staff has reviewed these requests and recommends approval of tabs 92 and 93. Thank you. Do we have any comments or questions from commissioners? Are you looking for the, a motion together? I think we have public testimony as well. Are you looking to separate these out? Um, I think motion together is what the intent. And I can still take public comment. But we can take public comment. Great, thank you. So we have public comment. Yes. Carson Link, I do see you. You have your hand raised and intent on commenting on item ninety-three. You are now muted. Oh, there we go. <laughs> Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Carson Link. and I'm a representative from Senator Monique Lamone's office. Uh, I'm here to speak with you today about the potential to allocate $8.4 million of this funding to Santa Barbara County in order for our uh, community to purchase eight zero emission buses. Santa Barbara County lies on a strong public transportation infrastructure to maintain our workforce, make all of the activities our coastal community has to offer accessible. This is especially true in North County, a more rural and agricultural area where transportation down the coast is inconsistent 
Our community requires cleaner, more environmentally friendly options for public transportation. The funding you are considering today would do just this and give a mid-sized county like ours more tools and resources to be able to meet our green transportation goals. Thank you so much for your time and consideration. Thank you. Forgive me, I, I caught as much as I could. I didn't hear um, the speaker mentioned he was representing a, a public official. Could that be? Senator, Senator Monique Lamont. State Senator. Sounds like he was talking about Santa Barbara. Santa Cruz. Santa Cruz. Santa Cruz. Yeah, Santa Cruz. Could you say that one more time, please? A little slower. We're from Santa Barbara County. My understanding is that this, some of this funding would go towards that. No, I didn't. What? He said, he said it's my County. understanding that some of the money goes towards something. What was that? We are from Santa Barbara County. Santa Barbara County. Santa Barbara County. That's 92. Okay. Oh, then I my apologies. I was I was given the wrong number. This is for 92. 92. 92. Right. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions from uh, the commissioners? Then I will entertain a motion to so approve 92 and 93. So moved. Second, Bradshaw. So we have a motion by Vice Chair, a second by Lou. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. Anya, 94. Tab 94 is an action item requesting allocation of $1,986,000 in local partnership formulaic program funds for three locally administered projects. One project is in Nevada County and two are in Merced County. Staff has reviewed these requests and they are consistent with the local partnership formulaic program guidelines and staff is recommending your approval of tab 94. Thank you, Anna. Any questions? Any public comment? John? <laughs> Any public comment on 94? <laughs> Not John, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> uh, do I have a motion? Motion to approve, Bradshaw. Bradshaw, second, Norton. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. 95. Uh, commissioners, tab 95 is an allocation request for $24,074,000 for the locally administered I-10 eastbound truck climbing lane project in Yucaipa on the highway, high, state highway system in San Bernardino County. Project improves goods movement, makes safety and operational improvements. Staff has reviewed the request and recommends approval. Thank you. Questions, comments from commissioners? Any public comment? Justin? <laughs> Seeing no public comment for this item at this time. Thank you. Thank you. Moved by Lou. Moved by Lou. Do I have a second? Second, Bradshaw. Second, Bradshaw. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. 96. Commissioners, tab 96 is an action item. Please note that the allocation request of $621,000 for project number seven was withdrawn. So my recommendation will differ from the amount shown on the agenda and in your book item. This is an action item to approve allocations of $25,139,000 for 11 active transportation program projects. Staff has reviewed these allocation requests and finds them consistent with the active transportation program guidelines and the adopted program. Therefore, staff recommends approval with the changes noted earlier in my presentation. Thank you. And which one was removed? Um, so it was project number seven. That was the Modoc Road project. Okay. Thank you. Any comments or questions? Any public comment? I see no public comment at this time. Thank you. Thank you. I'll entertain a motion. Motion to approve, Bradshaw. Bradshaw moves. Do I have a second? Second, Lou. Second, Lou. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries, 97. M Madam Chair, I had a question. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Process question. What do we do with item 52? Do we decide to give them a 30 day extension or I don't remember how we left that one? Um, it was 52 was withdrawn. A 30 day extension. Beforehand, yeah. All right, thank you. Go ahead, sorry. Thanks. 
Uh, so tab 97 is an action item to approve a 710,000 advanced PA&ED phase allocation for the California Department of Transportation's Los Alamos Connected Community Project in San Luis Obispo County on State Route 135. Staff has reviewed this allocation request and finds it consistent with the active transportation program guidelines and the adopted program, therefore staff are approving this approval. Thank you. Any questions? Any public comment? I see no public comment for this item. Thank you. Thank you. I'll entertain a motion on 97. Moved by Lou. Lou, second by Falcone. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. 98, Monica. Tab 98 is an action item requesting to allocate 34,598,000 in transit and inner city rail capital program funds to one project awarded in the 20 cycle and 10 projects awarded in the 2022 <coughs> cycle. Staff has reviewed the request and find them consistent with the transit inner city rail capital program allocation policy and program update. Staff recommends your approval. Thank you. Any questions on 98? Just note, this is the one I was talking about yesterday all these good projects mm. so move grisby a good project this is a good, good project, project. Second Norton. nice was it grisby that moved thank you all those in favor aye i'm sure who made this norton opposed motion carries Jaden, 99 through 103. good afternoon chair eager commissioners and executive director wise for the sake of time, we'll be taking tabs 99 through 107 together. 107. Ooh. Okay, sorry. So, ta yeah. <laughs> yeah. so tabs 99 through 107 are action items to consider approval of time extensions for 11 state highway operations and protection program projects, eight active transportation program projects, one state transportation improvement program project, one local partnership program project, one local bridge seismic retrofit program project, and to amend seven state highway operation and protection program projects. These time extensions are consistent with their, with their respective program guidelines, with the exception of the seven state highway operations and protection program time extension amendment request. Staff has reviewed tabs 99 through 107 and recommends approval. Thank you. Do we have any commissioners that have questions? <laughs> we have public comment. I see no public comment at this time for any of these items. Thank you. Second, Bradshaw. Okay. All those in favor? Aye. 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 <laughs> Martina, Bradshaw, second. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Approved, yes. Okay, 108. <laughs> Hello, commissioners. Tab 108 is an action item to approve a post-fact project completion time extension request for the multi-funded STIP and Trade Corridor Enhancement Program Route 132 Expressway Phase 1 project in Stanislaus County. The City of Modesto is requesting an additional nine months for project completion until June 30th, 2023. Staff has reviewed the request and recommends your approval of tab 108 as shown on the time extension table. Thank you. Commissioners, have any questions? Do we have any public comment on 108? I see no public comment for item 108. Thank you. Thank you for the item. Norton makes the motion. Do I have a second, second. from Bradshaw? All those in favor? All right. All right. Opposed? Motion carries. Well, thank you. At this time, um, we'll go into public comment, and then if any of our commissioners want to make a closing statement, we'll do that after general public comment. Thank you. We did receive one written comment for this general comment period. It is in reference to item 85. It comes from Mike Garabedian. He asks, of the three Placer County CRRSAA projects, what are the projects of the second and third allocations? Mm -hmm. Yes, I will repeat the question. Of the three Placer County CRRSAA projects, what are the projects of the second and third allocations? 
for tab 85? Yes. Um, I actually don't have that answer. And uh, commissioners, we do have the email address. We'll connect him with Casey and she can respond Thank by you. email. That'd be great. Thank, Thank you. you. Perfect. Any other public comment? See no other public public comment at this time. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. We have any commissioners that would make like to make a comment? Yeah, I'd like to make one final comment, and that was that I just wanted to say that when we re upped and reelected uh, Chair Eager and Vice Chair Gardino, that that was really a reflection of the hard work and and really the extraordinary effort it takes to be uh, the vice chair and chair of CTC. And while we were running through the meeting and wanted to get to all the other items, I just really wanted to take another time for us to congratulate them on their reelection. Okay. So do we have any other commissioners that would like to make any statements or comments? Then with that, um, our session will be adjourned. The commissioners are gonna go into closed session. At the end of that closed session, we will come back out and report on that session. Um, but at this time, we're gonna have to ask all of you to get the heck out. Um, but thank you all. Thank you all for being here. It was a wonderful meeting and thank you to Placer County.